Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of The Great Philosophical Abyss. In this episode, we'll talk about seemingly everything you can think of related to alcohol and ultimately ask, among other things, should human beings consume alcohol? So again, this is episode four of The Great Philosophical Abyss. Thanks for joining me here. As I usually do, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why I'm asking this question. Uh, but this episode in particular, is, uh, as compared to at least the prior episode, um, this one you might say has been, wait for it here, wait, wait, brewing for a while. Uh, the last episode, episode three, when I asked, should I give you a kidney, uh, as I intimated in that episode, uh, what sparked the episode was from the previous night. So I literally just thought about it and uh, created the episode in, in, a, in a day, basically. As compared to that, this episode, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about. It's been weeks in the making, if not years, if not decades, really, for reasons we'll find out here shortly. Um, so it's one that I've done a lot of thinking about. And in fact, I've been kind of holding off in terms of doing the video just because I want to make sure that I've covered everything. And I've always, always kind of nervous that um, if I do the video, I'll, I'll think of all these things that I, that I um, don't, don't think about or don't touch on in, in the video. But ultimately, I, I drew the line. I said I got to actually do the video here. Uh, and the whole point here is that this is going to be a, a rather extensive uh, look at alcohol. Um, again, it's, as I intimated, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about kind of in the, uh, maybe not so much in the forefront of my mind, maybe not, um, you know, consciously a lot throughout my life, but it's always been there in the back of my mind, kind of this questioning of, uh, alcohol, its role in my life and kind of its role in society in general. Um, so it's always kind of been there and, you know, I'll get into why in particular lately it's been, a, a especially it's been of significance lately for me. Uh, and so I mentioned how again, ex extensive this episode is going to be. In fact, I've broken it down into to like nine parts, basically. I'll talk about the background again for why I'm diving into it now, this issue. I'll talk a little bit about my history with alcohol, and I'll be honest, it's going to be a little um, uncomfortable at times. So one of the things I'll do is Actually, I'm kind of a, uh, lately in my life, I've been a health freak and I've kept a lot of uh, stats. You know, I, I track like how much I sleep and drink alcohol is one of the things I track. And so I went for this episode, I went back and actually dug into the numbers in terms of my alcohol consumption. And so one of the things I'll get into is, you know, how surprising some of that, those numbers were. Uh, and so again, you'll hear about my personal experience for better or worse uh, with alcohol uh, from, from the beginning, from my childhood up till, till nowadays. Uh, then I'm going to get into, so that was like part two, part three, four, and five are kind of like, um, the science, if you will, of alcohol. I'll, you know, the, the third part will be, you know, what is alcohol? I'll talk, touch very briefly, you know, um, I'm going to be touching a lot of different aspects of the, of alcohol in general. So I don't want to spend too much time, say on the science of alcohol, what is alcohol, but I will offer a sort of brief summary, if you will, of what alcohol actually is. I'll talk, uh, and I think this is an especially important part, part four, what I've called part four. I'll talk about how alcohol actually interacts with our body. Um, and then I'll get into part five, kind of a related sort of, the flip side of that coin is how it works psychologically with respect to us, or I would say on a subconscious level, uh, what it's doing with respect to us. Um, so again, uh, those three parts are kind of digging into what alcohol really is, uh, how it interacts with us, um, and sort of why, I guess you could say, why why it's so alluring for so many people and for some people why it can be so difficult to um, overcome in terms of, you know, setting it aside or if, if someone doesn't want to partake anymore, why it can be at times so difficult for these kinds of people. Uh, I'll get into then... Uh, part six, well, I'll dive into sort of starting to speak to this, you know, the utility of alcohol. So let us ask, you know, what are the benefits of consuming alcohol? You know, what are the detriments? You know, so I'll try to, as best I can, offer a fair portrayal of both for and against, again, the consumption of alcohol. And then in large part, based on what I'll uh, sort of relay in that part, I'll subsequently in section or part uh, seven, get into sort of the alcohol versus marijuana debate. You know, 
Um, why is it that alcohol is legal and has been at least for many decades now, and yet marijuana has been at least federally illegal for, for as long as we you know, can remember, right? So why is that? Um, give, especially given, as I'll uh, reiterate throughout, some of the things that we're going to come up with and, and talk about in terms of uh, especially the cons associated with alcohol. You know, why is it that alcohol nevertheless remains legal? And something like marijuana, which, you know, uh, the medicinal benefits of marijuana seem to be something we can no longer, or some of us can no longer deny. Why is it that that is still illegal? So we'll get into that. I'll get into uh, part eight. Um, this, again, reflects back on the psychology of our interaction with alcohol. Uh, but I'll get into kind of the, the, the aspects of quitting alcohol. Um, or cutting back or trying to, uh, which again can be very uh, difficult for a lot of us and I think is again related to the subconscious elements of the process and what's going on when we consume it, when we consume alcohol. Um, so again, I'll get into that. I'll get into kind of, so I, if you couldn't tell, I've done a lot of reflecting on you know alcohol lately, especially. Uh, I'll get into some of my, what I've called for a lack of better uh, term, uh, tools or tips for, for quitting or cutting back on alcohol. So again, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I've showed my notebooks in previous episodes and videos I've done, but this is all from, you know, the, the past few weeks where I, I knew I was going to do this episode. And so I was taking notes and um, again, I'll try to hit on uh, uh, all that stuff and more coming up. And the, finally though, what I'll end up with then. Um, so some of those tools and tips were the whole point was, or were in, uh, you know, some of the things I thought about as I was getting ready for this episode. But finally, we'll end with, uh, of course, getting off the philosophical fence. At least I'll try to. Now, we've seen that in some of these episodes, that's been rather difficult for me. Will it be that difficult for me this time around? We shall see. So that'll be part nine. So again, a lot to get into here. So let's go ahead and dive in. So I already intimated that, you know, I've been, that the issues related to alcohol, you know, what's it doing for me, if anything? You know, what am I really getting out of it? Why do I feel the allure to consume it? Um, these are questions, and again, I'm very, pretty philosophical, so I question a lot of things, but these are things that, these, these are questions that have always kind of lingered in the back of my mind. Again, maybe not at the forefront of my conscious reflection at all times, but certainly uh, were things that I pondered throughout, throughout my existence, and I'm sure that's probably true of a lot of you. Um, but lately, in particular, I've really become interested in, in it for a few reasons. So I wanted to mention kind of, uh, you know, what were some of those those reasons, you know, of late, you know, why why the interest in alcohol, especially recently, given that it's always been something that's been of interest to me. Uh, well, that's, I guess, number one reason would be that I have a really good friend who, um, and so I'll kind of get into the dy dynamics of this this friend. What should we call him? Uh, Billy. Let's call him Billy, although I'll probably forget that. Billy, for the purposes of, of this episode, has had a lot of uh, issues recently. He's basically my age. Um, really, really good friend. And, you know, has had a lot of, uh, again, significant uh, you know, problems in his life recently. Um, and he and his uh, wife uh, divorced, you know, all sorts of, of uh, issues. Um, Things that would make most of us significantly depressed. And in the process of sort of trying to work through a lot of those issues, one thing that he figured out was that alcohol was the source of a lot of his issues. Now, me, and I'm a distant observer at this point, you know, I'm not, we, we don't hang out near as, nearly as often as we used to or as I would like. But from my perspective, you know, I never saw him as having a problem. And I think, uh, you know, maybe this speaks to as one of the things I'll get into is kind of the relative nature of our experiences with alcohol. Um, you know, and we tend to get sort of just focus on our own experience and don't realize that, you know, it might be vastly different for others. But from my perspective, at least, you know, I never, from what I witnessed, I never would have guessed that he would had a problem with alcohol or thought he had a problem with alcohol. But uh, as he worked through his various issues, he reduced a lot of his issues and struggles to his consumption of alcohol. And so last June, June uh, 2021, he basically decided he had enough um, and said, you know, I'm done. And so ever since he's so here we are, April 2022, uh, almost a year now, 
he hasn't touched it, you know, he hasn't consumed alcohol. And um, again, I'll kind of juxtapose me and kind of working through some of my thoughts and with him and how he's come to this conclusion that, you know, he will not um, touch the stuff again. Uh, and I'll juxtapose that as we'll see with kind of where I'm at. Uh, but so anyway, I had this this very good friend of mine that's gone through this experience. And, you know, it was, as I intimated earlier, it was kind of a surprise to me at first because I would have never associated really his consumption of alcohol with a lot of these problems. And I'm not sure, you know, again, I don't know how much of it ultimately really did boil down to his alcohol consumption. I and mean, that's probably something obviously he can much better answer. But in his op opinion, at least, um, it was a significant factor. And so he decided it was best for him, as I suggested, to just give it up altogether. Not just cut back a little bit, but just he's done with it. He's never touching it again. So obviously, having a good friend uh, with that sort of reaction to alcohol is going to make you think a little bit more about it, uh, especially since, you know, we'll get together. And whereas in the past, our get togethers would have been drinking beers, right? We would have been drinking beers. Now he's not. So obviously uh, he's not doing that when we're getting together. So obviously that's going to lead me to do some, some, uh, some thinking on the issues myself, you know? Uh, so that was a, a big factor. Um, I would also say, so I mentioned how it's kind of always in the back of my mind, but as I've gotten older and, and I'll uh, reiterate this as we proceed here, and as the effects, the positive uh, associated with consuming have become less and less palpable, I would say that I have become more and more um, quizzical or uh, skeptical of alcohol. Uh, and so that's been more and more true itself um, leading up to this. So that is another factor. And so combine those two um, things, right, my significant uh, buddies, uh, you know, divorce, if you will, from alcohol, and then combine that with the increasing sort of interest in alcohol myself, given what seemed to me to have been a lack of positives associated with it as I've gotten older. This led then to me, the third thing that's sort of sparked my interest recently, then getting a bunch of books, uh, literature on the matter, and I've been doing a lot of reading. And so when he told me that, um, you know, back in the last summer, I immediately was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, maybe I'll try to quit along with you or at least take a break uh, with you. And so I, and I can't remember which month I have the stats here, which I'll get into, get into uh, later. But, uh, you know, one of those, maybe it was um, right after he told me, in fact, I took a month off um, from alcohol and I'll do that periodically. Um, but uh, at, at any rate, so as soon as he told me that, I basically was like, okay, well, um, that sounds interesting. Let me uh, dive into it more and let me maybe try uh, a break from it. And so I immediately picked up these three books uh, after doing, you know, a little research into uh, books on alcohol. And so this is a Craig Beck, Alcohol Lied to Me, very, very uh, popular book. He's got a bunch of videos on YouTube of the three. And I so I read all these, I want to say last August um, or shortly after he told me that. Um, I read all three of these. Of these three, this one's my least favorite. Uh, I won't, won't really get into to why. Um, we got enough stuff to talk about. Annie Grace, this is a, a good one. I enjoyed um, reading this quite a bit. This, hers is called This N uh, Naked Mind, Control Alcohol. And one thing I will say in all the, the ones that I read, at least all the literature that I read, you do see a lot of the same recurring themes. Um, and again, these, all three of these authors are former alcoholics uh, who o overcame their addiction. Um, and so you'll see a lot of the same recurring themes. Um, but I definitely found then of the three, Annie Grace's was, was pretty good, but I liked William Porter's the best, uh, alcohol explained. It was, I think what I liked about it was it was just straight to the point and, um, sciencey with, so like based in the facts, so to speak, without getting inundated with like journal articles and so on. So it was, uh, you know, he's a lawyer, so he's, um, well-spoken, you know, you can tell all these, you know, they all know what they're talking about. They all have a good grasp um, of the issues involved. So don't get me wrong there. But I just like the presentation, I guess, and the uh, approach that Porter uh, used. And so I read all three of them. And this, is, this is the one I liked the most. And I was pleasantly surprised then probably about a month ago when I found out he wrote a sequel. So I ordered it and promptly read it. And this is really then what 
you know, after I worked through that one, um, that's the point at which I was like, oh, I, I have a lot, I think, to say. You know, I have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts on the, uh, the issue of alcohol, the issues related to alcohol. Maybe I could, you know, do an episode on it you know, um, and work through some of my thoughts. And so, again, that was then all these kind of factors then uh, were, were the impetus for then this episode. Right. So, um, I will say as well, before I move on, that in addition to being interested in, in it myself, for reasons I've already uh, alluded to, I do think, uh, for reasons that will become obvious as we proceed, that, you know, I think it's important to tackle alcohol and the related issues associated with it, because it might literally be one of the biggest poisons um, plaguing our society uh, and us as individuals. And I don't, I'm not trying to be dramatic here either. You know, as we work through this stuff, hopefully it'll become clear why I'm saying this. And so given the significance of the issues associated with alcohol, um, I mean, it literally does have a very significant effect, I think, on, again, not just us as individuals, but our, our well-being as a society, as, as a culture. So I, I wonder, you know, what, again, what is it doing for us individually and as a culture, as a society? And so that is also a reason why I want to um, draw our attention to it and do an episode on, on this issue, on alcohol. Okay. Now, a few disclaimers before I wrap up part one and dive into part two, where we'll get into uh, my history with alcohol, which ought to be, again, fun. Disclaimer number one, I sort of already foreshadowed that I'm going to be getting into uh, some of the, a lot of the reasons to be suspic suspicious of alcohol. Um, but having said all that, you know, I want to say at the outset, disclaimer number one, that I try to refrain from, you know, this is true in general of being judgmental of anyone, you know, given all the mistakes I've made and, and so on. But, you know, especially, not especially, but when it comes to alcohol, or especially with respect to this episode, I should say, right, when it comes to alcohol, I try not to be too judgmental, um, regardless of the conclusions I reach and, you know, despite what the episode might suggest, uh, because I've been on... You know, I, I'm sympathetic to all sides of the issues related to alcohol. And I've been, you know, I've drank my fair share, you know, I've for sure of, of alcohol. I've uh, experienced, you know, my fair share of uh, negative experiences that you won't be hearing about here. You know, uh, we have actually brought some props. You know, we one of the things my wife and I do, or at least used to, uh, when we would, you know, wherever we'd go, we'd travel around on vacations and stuff. We would, you know, we liked the uh, micro brews, and so we would go and get a growler from the various uh, micro breweries we visited. This is my hometown's uh, growler, Harney Thunderhead Brewing. Um, so, you know, uh, we those are still in my kitchen. We have, uh, you know, like literally 40 growlers uh, above the cabinets around my kitchen. I, I made, so on some of my other videos, I've referenced um, that I've designed and play strategy board games. And one of the games I made, you know, one of the better ones, I think, in my opinion, that I've made is about beer and about brewing your own uh, beers. So, um, again, lots of props here. Now, this is all just to, to uh, emphasize and, and say again that, um, you know, if you drink, if you consume alcohol, again, and most people that I know, and that'll be one of the things I'll mention throughout here, they do consume, right? So, no judgment here, uh, and I still will see, you know, am I going to continue to consume? We'll see at the end of the episode. Uh, but as I mentioned, I have done my fair share, at the very least, of uh, consuming alcohol, experiencing the negatives associated with it, and, you know, some positives as well, right? So, again, no judgment from me. Um, I'm sympathetic, okay, to all sides with respect to um, consuming alcohol. Disclaimer number two, so I will get into, as I suggested, right, some of the science involved, um, you know, the physical effects involved with consuming alcohol, but disclaimer number two, you know, I'm not a doctor, I don't have a medical degree, so you've been advised, right, I'll probably reiterate that, but I have done, as I hope to have, you know, uh, suggested here, I, I've done a lot of research, I've done a lot of reading, but Again, I don't have a medical degree, and so my understanding of a lot of the science involved and the psychology involved 
it's not going to be that nuanced, right? But I think, um, on the other hand, uh, I hope to present the issues, right, in an understandable way, in a digestible way, um, and would, again, reiterate that I have done the research, right? But the whole point of the disclaimer was, again, not a, a doctor, um, you know, not a chemist either. I'll get into, you know, the what is literally what is alcohol, right? But I'm not a chemist, okay? Um, so that was disclaimer number two. Um, I'm a philosopher, not a doctor, not a chemist, etc. And then disclaimer number three, and this will definitely be a theme that uh, I'll pick up on throughout the rest of the episode. And I already mentioned it earlier. And that's that um, as I prepared for the episode, it really occurred to me how much of our experiences with alcohol probably are relative to us in our specific environment and circumstances we happen to have been exposed to, right? So, you know, I had all these impressions of alcohol as a result of my childhood, which I'll get into here in a moment, you know, and um, I think for a long time, I just, that was sort of my fixed view of alcohol in general. And, you know, I think it takes time and this is probably true of all kinds of things and not just our, with respect to our view of alcohol, but with time, right, I've come to realize that, you know, maybe uh, it wasn't as front and center um, at gatherings for other people, right, as it was for me growing up, right, or maybe um, not 90% of my, you know, other people's high school graduating class had consumed alcohol, whereas that seemed to be at least the case, or it seemed to be true of my class. So, again, that was definitely something I um, couldn't help but pick up on as I took all these copious notes and, you know, in terms of my reflections and so on that, you know, started to dawn on me, um, you know, just because I consume this amount on average, for example, when drinking, that's doesn't, you know, that's probably not the same for the average person. Because one of the things I'll get into is that I've always seemed to have had a, a high tolerance um, for, you know, mind altering substances, if you will. So, and alcohol is no exception. Um, and so I will form certain opinions and, you know, my perspective will be, Formed accordingly, right? And I'll lose sight, perhaps, that hey, that's only true of me, right? In my perspective, it might not be indicative of, of what's the case for others. Okay, so I just wanted to really make sure I emphasize that from the outset. And I'll I'll mention at least one or two times I think where um, you know times where it's like, oh, uh, this probably speaks to the relative nature of our experience with alcohol. Okay, so what's normal to me again with respect to alcohol. That may very well, admittedly, not be what was normal for, for you or anyone else. Okay, so moving on to part two, right? So I've mentioned, got into my the background, you know, why it is I'm diving into this, why I've been interested, but then especially lately, okay? Let's talk a little bit about my history with alcohol. So, you know, and this probably speaks to why I've always kind of been at least subtly interested in the topic. It begins with again, my childhood, growing up, particularly with my mother, who uh, had an alcoholic father. So this naturally uh, affected her significantly, which in turn affected my childhood significantly. I mean, not that significantly, I guess, but it certainly affected my, my childhood, in this, uh, at least with respect to my perspective of alcohol, uh, because, you know, all those profound ways that alcoholics affect their children, well, you know, that then seeped through in my mom and I saw that, right? So all her feelings then with respect to uh, alcohol, I, you know, she was sharing those with me. Um, and I think that's a really, what I'm thinking about, that's a really difficult position for a parent to be in when they've had an alcoholic parent. Um, and I think, you know, in my experience, at least when that's true, either the, the child grows up to become an alcoholic themselves, oftentimes, unfortunately, or they'll go grow up and resent alcohol and completely revolt against it, right? And that's what my my mother did. And you know, both paths have their difficulties because my mom, for example, you know, um, I don't know how much she wrestled with this, but as a parent, you know, you don't want to be at least if you have a rebellious sort of child like I was, you don't want to say you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And so, but on the other hand, when you've had such negative experiences with alcohol, like my mother did, it's hard to not point out all the negatives, right? And say, you can't do this because it's so bad for you. At least you think that, right? Uh, so it's an incredibly difficult position, I think, that 
a lot of you know parents like my mom um, are put in. You know, how do you approach that with your kids, given all your extreme, you know, strong opinions that you have regarding what you believe to be a, a terrible poison? Right? You don't want to make it into the turn it into the forbidden fruit that then really tempts them, right? Which I think is ultimately, to be honest, what ended up happening with me. You know, I, I don't blame my mom at all for for uh, anything that I ultimately did with respect to alcohol. Uh, but I do think there was that element of, you know, she was so against it um, that it was like, well, what is it? You know, I had that it spawned in a curiosity um, in me right, and an interest in, in, in alcohol. Uh, so I do think, again, that's kind of speaks to the difficulty of it. You know, you don't want to constantly be harping on how bad it is because then maybe they'll sort of become curious as a result. But uh, anyway, so I had, uh, you know, a, a mom that w had a very, uh, you know, alcoholic father, which had very, very uh, negative influence on my mom, uh, which then I heard all about. So not surprisingly, then when I was growing up as a child, I alcohol was not really part of my uh, immediate family's life. Uh, Whereas other families of uh, friends, you know, their parents would be routinely drinking beers at um, dinners and so on. That wasn't the case at all for, for my parents and my family. In fact, um, I was trying to think preparing for the episode, you know, I could probably count on one hand the, the times I remember my mother drinking in my entire life and none of them are in my adult life. Um, I have vague memories, you know, of a few times maybe uh, in my childhood when she would drink and it was always peach schnapps she would would have not always but she, there would be a bottle of peach schnapps if she was going to be drinking uh, I guess that's what her and her mom her mother um, was her drink as well so it's weird how to me how she had a drink even though she literally drank probably five times in my entire life that I'm aware of um, but anyway that's what what she drank when she drank those five times uh, so again I know other parents who were drinking five times in a week and my mom literally drank like five times that I remember in my entire life and they were again okay, a long time ago my dad didn't drink much at all either if I had to guess you know let's say every one or two months he might have this is just on average he might have four or five beers so it was like a one-time event every this is an average thing maybe every month or two uh, now he like me given we have this same kind of tendency over time, we're very erratic within certain amounts of time. So like, uh, you know, there would be, there would be periods of time where maybe he would drink, you know, a, a three or four nights in a particular week, but that would be a totally anom anomaly, right? And then he wouldn't drink for months. Um, but on average, again, if I had to sort of guess what, you know, his consumption was on average, it was like only once maybe, you know, every month or every other month. And it was only like four beers, four or five beers. So moral of the story, uh, I wasn't very exposed to, you know, they never, uh, you know, hard liquor, never saw that. And wasn't very, very rarely exposed to uh, alcohol growing up. Um, now, as I mentioned, I did have this sort of curiosity uh, emerging you know, as a result, I think a lot of my mom's very extreme, or at least what seemed to me, given that I wasn't necessarily seeing it in other parents, extreme perspective of alcohol. Well, that naturally, I think, as I suggested, um, created some curiosity on my part with respect to alcohol. Um, and then on top of that, it did seem like it was everywhere. And it still kind of does to me seem like it's everywhere. Um, so for these reasons, like things kind of changed. The whole point was, um, you know, how could it be that you know, I came from that sort of immediate family environment and then became, you know, started consuming alcohol to the extent at least I, I did for most of my adult life. Uh, well, there's definitely factors, right? It's everywhere. And that's um, one of the themes I'll hammer home throughout the, the rest of the episode, right? I mean, look, it's literally at seemingly every occasion, it's in advertising everywhere, right? So even if you grow up, in an environment like I did, you know, or an immediate family environment like I did, where there's no alcohol involved, you're not going to escape, right, the influence and impressionability of alcohol given the society and culture we live in, right? And I will say again, granted the relative nature of a lot of this, um, at least growing up where I did, 
uh, at the time at least, it seemed like that's what um, high schoolers did, or at least a lot of them, uh, was they would go out on the weekends and party, uh, especially, you know, the juniors and seniors. And so fast forward, right, as I grew older, that's kind of what I ended up doing. So I would say if I had to guess, I don't actually remember specifically, but if I had to guess, you know, my first drink of alcohol was probably like junior year of high school, but I didn't really start consuming alcohol you know, regularly. And by that, I mean, maybe once every other weekend or something like that. Um, I didn't really do that, you know, partying until senior year of high school. But then it was uh, kind of a, a fairly regular uh, thing, I would say, during, you know, especially the latter, the second half of my senior year. But again, this was normal, at least from my perspective. This is what all the kids I was, you know, my friends and classmates, everyone I was familiar with, this is what they were doing. And it seemed to me that's what had always been done. It was kind of like a, a rite of passage, if you will, of going through, you know, not only high school, but then college. And that's where um, it, things really got, uh, in terms of alcohol consumption, that's where it really progressed for me. Uh, freshman and sophomore years were, were years uh, of undergrad, were years of heavy alcohol consumption for me. And again, See, that seemed to be indicative or, or true of all the freshmen and sophomores, not all, but most of them that, that I was familiar with. I mean, maybe it was just the company I was keeping. I don't know. Maybe, again, it's just relative to our own per perspective or experience. But that certainly seemed to be what was normal uh, in, in my experience. Uh, and so I think that's worth pointing out, like, that if, insofar as maybe that is true, it's not just true of me, but for others. Uh, right at this sense that, you know, drinking in high school and drinking, at least in college, that that's like normal and there's nothing wrong with it. I think that's actually a huge issue. Um, and, you know, if that, if that is true, that it's not just true for my experience, but it's, it's true for, for many people. That's a huge issue. Again, given what some of the negatives are that we'll get into with respect to alcohol. All right. Why is it that it's viewed as kind of like this rite of passage that's, you know, cool or that, um, you know, that we just kind of do as we progress through our early college years, or early 20s. Um, you know, how much damage is that doing? Uh, or how much damage, at least, did it do to me? I, I wonder that. Um, and I think if we want to diminish our problems that we experience with respect to alcohol, uh, we have to do something about that, right? This, um, this portrayal of, of these formative years of ours, right, are later high school and you know, college years, right? a portrayal of them as being like these experimental, granted that it, they are very experimental years, but like with respect to alcohol, like it's just what happens and um, you know, it's what all the cool kids do. And it's just something that everyone does. It's like a rite of passage. No, I think that, um, you know, if we want to experience significant change in our well-being, if all the negatives associated with alcohol are true, we have to stamp that out, right? We have to eradicate that portrayal of alcohol as being, you know, this binge drinking, this excessive consumption of alcohol during these formative years of our um, youth, we have to expunge that, get rid of that, eradicate that kind of expectation or that acceptance of that as being kind of rite of passage. No. Anyway, so that's, a, I guess, a little mini rant there. So again, that was my um, high school and college experience with at least undergrad experience with uh, alcohol. Again, that was probably my heaviest consumption period would have been, uh, especially freshman and sophomore years of undergrad. I would say after my sophomore year of, uh, of undergrad, I kind of sort of just started to mature a little bit more, you might say. And with that, not surprisingly, you might say, the alcohol consumption also um, ceased to be so excessive or at least what I, I mean, at that point, it, it seemed to be uh, in all my life, right, the most excessive. Um, so, again, as I got older, uh, you know, junior year of undergrad and then especially getting into graduate school, I definitely scaled back in terms of the alcohol consumption. But, uh, you know, I've kept stats here you know, the last five years or so of my life in terms of all kinds of crazy stats. Um, I never, you know, granted that I scaled it back. I was certainly consuming alcohol, um, junior, uh, again, junior year through college, junior year of college, undergrad, all the way through, uh, through this, uh, last year. Now, 
I don't, I don't think I've ever mentioned this yet in this episode, but I have not drank this year yet. So 2022 has been um, completely sober for me. So what is that? Three complete months. Um, but otherwise, pretty much, again, post-undergrad, up until and through 2021, I had a very sort of, uh, the, the, how much I consumed was, it was uh, the same. Um, and it wasn't as much as, again, early uh, undergrad. But uh, I did take one period when we moved out to Boston. Uh, this would have been uh, sort of the first year I was in graduate school. I took six months off. But other than that, I had basically consumed alcohol. Uh, I, I assume, and what I assume is, a, again, a sort of repeating sort of pattern that's similar to the last five years of data that I've taken. Like, I don't, I'm not saying this very well, but the point is, um, post-undergrad, pretty much my whole life, I, I had the same drinking habits and patterns as I did in much of this data. So, um, and what did that look like? Well, it wasn't necessarily pretty, and I was surprised when I went through and tabulated this. And I, you know, actually, I want to make a small qualification to that because I did get healthier. I have been a much healthier the past five years. And so maybe that slightly affected my alcohol intake, but I really don't think it did that much, uh, if at all, because again, given some of the numbers and just um, given some of the expenditures and, you know, and so on, I, I had the same occasions, right, where I would drink, right? It, it seemed like, again, the same habits and tendencies pretty, th pretty much throughout most of my adult life. Okay, so what are some of the um, stats? Well... On average, so yeah, it wasn't. Um, I don't know, it's not necessarily pre pretty. So, I have basically 55 months of data um, going through, so from now going backwards. Uh, so, I analyzed, assuming there's 30, roughly 30 days in those 55 months, I analyzed about 1,650 days were analyzed, and of those 1,650 days. I consumed alcohol on 467 of those days. So 467 out of 1,650. Okay. And so that works out to roughly 28% of, I think this is, again, pretty much true, probably indicative of most of my adult life. I, I drank on average 28% right, of the days. So, oh, slightly more than every fourth day, I consumed alcohol. Uh, now, the um, that, I guess, I, that was surprising to me, but maybe not as surprising as how much per time I drink, right? It's one thing, well, how many days do you drink, but do you just have one beer, right? Or do you drink, you know, a 30-pack every time you drink, right? Huge difference. Uh, and... The numbers, right? So I had 2,777, somehow 0 0.08 total alcoholic drinks. I did do fractions. I don't know how a 0 0.08 shows up, um, but I would do like uh, three and a third alcoholic drinks, right? If I didn't finish a drink. But I don't remember ever putting in 0 0.08 or something that would re result in that. But anyway, over this whole span, right, um, 1,650 total days on which I, of which I drank 467 different days. Right. I drank a total of 2,777.08 alcoholic drinks. 2,777.08 drinks. Right. So total. So if you do the math, right, or at least go up here, that's more than uh, one alcoholic drink a day that I averaged. So that certainly surprised me a little bit. Um, So, yeah, I guess I wanted to sort of point out again what was typical for me, at least up through this past year. Um, now, granted, as I mentioned, I uh, changed a little bit here, right? This year, I so far anyway, and I'm, I don't have, we'll get into this more towards the end, but, um, you know, I don't necessarily have any firm definitive plans for the future. But up to this point this year, I have not. Um, Part, you know, have not drank alcohol yet. Okay, so one thing I want, and I've already mentioned this, right? I 
I've never really thought of myself as that normal. I always thought of myself as kind of normal. Uh, this, I meant to say this, right? It works out to almost a six pack a, uh, each time I would drink. So 2,777 you know, divided by the number of drinking sessions, that works out to 5.94 drinks per session or basically a six pack. Um, and so again, that kind of took me as my surprise too. Every time I drank, you know, on average over the last say five years, I drank six alcoholic drinks. Um, you know, at the time, right, it, it didn't seem like that. Um, uh, but again, I, I want to hammer this point home. I never ever thought of myself as, as being abnormal, like that I was doing any, anything that was that unusual. Um, but here, you know, is it actually normal for people that are drinking out there to be drinking almost a six pack? Now, granted, each time they drink, now, granted, as I've suggested earlier, I I've always had a high tolerance. And so, again, speaking to the relative nature of all this, maybe that um, is sort of one of the factors in terms of, well, drinking a six pack almost, you know, every time I drink. Uh, but that's still like, that was interesting to me, you know, almost a six pack every time. But I don't feel like, personally, like I'm that abnormal. In fact, um, I just had a, a discussion with a buddy of mine, you know, because that alcohol has been on my mind lately. And so, Naturally, we were discussing that, was, you know, he knows that I haven't been drinking this year and, um, you know, saying how, like, you know, I wonder what my tolerance is going to be. And he was mentioning how he's actually done the 30 pack challenge. Apparently there is a thing, a 30 pack challenge. You know, he's done it three times in his life and two of the three times were in the last few years. Uh, and this is this is not an alcoholic. This is a really good buddy of mine who is a great dad. Um, he's a you know, hard worker. Uh, so don't get the wrong idea here. Again, he seems normal to me and he's talking about completing the 30 pack challenge and I, I as i told him i think I, literally that would probably kill me right now if i tried to consume 30 30 beers uh, in one session but so a lot of mixed feelings here um i don't know how clear some of this is but like you know wow it's a six pack every time i drink but at the same time it didn't really feel like it that much and maybe that's just a reflection of my tolerance and you know is that normal or not well here i have a good friend who's doing the 30 pack challenge and Seemingly, you know, he, his, he didn't get sick, really. You know, it wasn't that terrible of an experience. In fact, you know, it was rather ho-hum is really how he kind of described it. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting how, you know, these numbers are kind of like, they were more than I was expecting. But yet, you know, what is like, if that seemed normal to me, then like, what are these people that seem like they're drinking a lot to me? Like, what are their numbers? I really wonder, you know, what are some of our numbers? other people out there right um by the way and i'll get into some of this um verbiage and uh you know we hear about like binge drinking and excessive drinking and so on the national institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism so niaa defines binge drinking as quote a pattern of drinking that brings blood alcohol levels to 0.08 or higher. This typically occurs after a woman consumes four or more drinks or a man consumes five or more drinks in about two hours. So basically, given that definition of binge drinking, I averaged, every time I drank, I was binge drinking on average. And again, if, if I really am normal, right, if it's not just a reflection of the relative nature of my experience, right, if, if um, you know, my experience is somewhat normal, then apparently there's lots of binge drinkers out there. Uh, now, the same, what is it, National uh, Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, they define alcohol, or heavy alcohol use or heavy drinking as, quote, for men, consuming more than four drinks on, on any day or more than 14 drinks per week. For women, consuming more than three drink, drinks on any day or more than seven drinks per week. So given that definition, there were many, many, many uh, days and many weeks that I would call quali have qualified for at least in you know, the past uh, heavy alcohol use, heavy drinking, and yet I don't consider again my usage as being that heavy, especially you know in my later adult life. And then we have what they call high intensity drinking, quote consumption of two or more times the gender specific threshold for binge drinking, which is to say ten or more standard drinks for males and eight or more for females. And there were several, you know, times when I, well, not several, but there were certainly, you know, times when I drank where, or sessions where, you know, I would have 10, you know, I mean, 
crazy to think about now because I couldn't come anywhere near 10, but um, yeah, so, you know, I part partook in this high intensity drinking. Uh, so all of this before I did the research, I would have never have you know suspected. I I would have acknowledged that I've part, you know done binge drinking, uh, but not to the extent. And then to I would have never have uh, associated myself with heavy alcohol use or heavy drinking, or at least not to the extent. Uh, let alone high intensity drinking. Okay, so they say this is again from the same institute. While only, only 25.8% of people ages 18 and older reported binge drinking in the past month, only 6.3% reported heavy alcohol use during the past month. Uh, such drinking appeared to be the norm for much of my adult life, though, right, as I mentioned. So although, I mean, again, if these numbers can be trusted, right, less than about a quarter of people only that have been drinking reported or sorry, not that just that they drank, but 25% of people in total, right, 18 and older, reported binge drinking in the last month. Okay, and then uh, where is 6.3% reported heavy alcohol use in the past month? Okay. Uh, well, I guess I'm part of the 25.8% and the 6.3%, uh, uh, at least most months in my life. Indeed, as my notes say here, my Average alcohol session, which again is according to the numbers, five basically 5.95 drinks per session, that constitutes heavy drinking. So my average was heavy drinking. Um, again, something that kind of speaks to the relative, I mentioned I would say a couple things that speak to this, right? The relative nature of our experience with alcohol. Um, I, I think of myself as normal, but am I? Um, again, I, I, I've always known I've had a high tolerance when it comes to alcohol. Um, but again, something that I, at least a few years back, would do that others that knew me thought was crazy is what I, after, you know, say going out with friends and, and drinking, you know, these heavy bouts of drinking, uh, I would come home and then go out and run, which they thought was insane. I mean, thinking back on it, um, you know, it is kind of crazy how much I would go out after, you know, drinking, say, six, seven beers and go out and run six miles. Um, but again, maybe that uh, speaks to sort of the relative nature of our experience with alcohol, you know, and how it affects people significantly in certain ways, and then other people, maybe not at all in those ways, right? Some people can go out and run uh, a marathon after drinking. Not that I, I've done that. I have run a marathon, finally, uh, but I'm not, you know, not after drinking alcohol, and probably never again, um, under, under the influence or sober. Um, but again, I thought that was kind of something that I was reflecting on that, you know, um, probably does speak to kind of in some way how, you know, my experience with alcohol is, is certainly unique in some sense, at least. Uh, and just to reiterate again, so I spoke to kind of what was the norm for me most of my adult life. That was through 2021, you know, fast forward to this year. And I didn't really have a resolution or New Year's resolution. A lot of times with the last few years, I would have health-related um, New Year's resolutions, but no, not this year. Uh, it wasn't, you know, something I had planned on doing. I just went, um, you know, again, a lot of it's probably related to all the research I've been doing and talking to my good friend, but it wasn't something I, I, you know, said, okay, I'm, I'm not drinking, you know, for one, two, three, you know, months or a year. It's just something that kind of happened, and. Um, you know, so I, I wanted to point that out when I'm talking about, you know, my, my experience with alcohol. Uh, and I will say, this is something I'll mention a little bit later when it comes to trying to, like, quit drinking, that, uh, you know, at first this year, right, uh, I would think about it quite a bit, you know, do I want to drink, do I want to have a few beers? But, you know, as the, the days went by and the weeks went by, I mean, you know, one month turned into two months and here we are you know, three months going into the fourth month. And, you know, I, well, again, it wasn't even something I planned on, but it became sort of easier and easier with time. And so, again, that'll be one thing I'll point to when it comes to if you want to cut back or try to quitting uh, consuming alcohol, uh, it definitely gets easier with time. Um, okay. So having said that, I wanted to say, and I don't want to, you know, uh, say too much about this and get into the science too much, uh, 
um, just enough to kind of um, have a grasp of what we need to to move forward. Um, <clears throat> but I did want to get into what alcohol is and what actually is alcohol. So again, a lot of my understanding of alcohol uh, has been gleaned, at least in terms of the science and over the past few weeks when I've been preparing for this episode. And then obviously in the books I've uh, read, again, a lot of the same recurring things all of the, uh, these guys pick up on, and they're obviously reflecting on the science and what the science says. And, um, so I'll, I'll mention some of the recurring things in, in those books as we proceed. But I guess the first thing I would, so just a couple things I want to say, I guess, you know, with respect to what alcohol is. Um, it's literally, so from taken from the Wikipedia article on it from uh, March 31st, 2022, it reads, quote, in chemistry, an alcohol is a type of organic compound that carries at least one hydroxyl functional group bound to a saturated carbon atom. And apparently that hydroxyl functional group is represented by this for all you chemists out there. Okay. So that's literally what it is, at least for the chemist. Okay. Um, and I think uh, one sort of salient uh, feature uh, aspect that I, would, I think behooves us to mention is there's actually several types of alcohol. Uh, for example, ethanol or uh, ethyl alcohol, and that's that's what we consume in you know alcoholic beverages. That's the type of alcohol that's in those. But then there's also isopropanol, methanol, et cetera. There's you know various um, types of alcohol. Okay? So that's what alcohol is. Now, I think much more important, at least in my mind, and what, what I want to talk about more and what I have a lot more observations on is, you know, how does alcohol interact with us, right? So given that's, you know, how the chemists would think of it, and there's these different types of alcohol, you know, what happens when we imbibe, right, ethanol or ethyl alcohol or alcohol, right? What happens uh, to us as that, as that happens? Now, a lot of us, probably most of us, at least many of us, already kind of have experience of this, right? Um, but how many of us have actually really reflected on the process, right? What is happening um, physiologically? And then so too sort of on a subconscious or psychological level. Those are the kinds of things I want to get into. And those are the kinds of things that I've done a lot of thinking about. And then these guys and gal do a lot of uh, thinking about and some talking about. Okay, so uh, the first thing I thought I would do is put up a graph. Goodbye, Billy. Um, that represents, and so this is one of the graphs that I put together as I was mulling some of these things over right, in my notes here. Put up a graph that in simple terms, kind of, I think, depicts what's going on when we consume alcohol and, in some sense, why we're screwed when we do so. Okay. Not to foreshadow too much here, but so bear with me here. I'm going to try to get this up here accurately. So here's our baseline, right? So this over here is, I'll put this, our mental state or like happiness. Okay, so this is baseline, let's just say zero, I don't know, zero utils if you're utilitarian, okay. So going up is positive, obviously, and this is negative, negative going down, less happy, okay. So what happens then, so we're going to, this is time then, going this way, specifically in terms of drinks, okay. So what happens when we drink? Right. What's going on in terms of our mood, for example? So let's go drink one here. So we start with our baseline mood. All right, something something inspires us to drink. And what is that something? You know, we'll get into that as well. Why is it we take that step? Not only the first time, but all those repeated times thereafter. Why is it we reach for the bottle? You know, what is it? We'll get into that later. But okay, so we... We start consuming that first beer, right? And as we're drinking that, so this is the consumption of the first beer. Uh, we reach a point here where what happens immediately, what's happening, right, is we're being 
flooded with alcohols and a depressant. Okay, so there's depressant and things that depress our system, and there's things that stimulate our system, right? Depressant stimulants. Okay, and so what happens with alcohol is it's a depressant, so it's depressing our system, and so our bodies, and this is this is what we, where the knowledge is power, or, or what we really have to understand, I think, to appreciate alcohol and to ultimately overcome it, if that's our desire, right, is our bodies are these finely tuned machines uh, that you know, that aspire above all, all else to keep us in optimal levels of health, right? We're keeping our optimal, you know, our chemistry at its optimal level, right, and keeping that at its equilibrium. Right, so there's a certain you know sort of state our body should be at optimally. Okay? And what's happening when we consume alcohol is we're we're throwing that off essentially. Right, we're um, adding more of a depressing right, a depressing effect. Right, that our body then immediately right it wants equilibrium, and so what it's going to do is immediately try to fight that off. Now the high that we experience from consuming alcohol is a result of right, that doling, depressant effect that alcohol has. But the catch is it's very short lasting because our body is Im immediately trying to counteract it, right? So we do feel, a, possibly, right, a slight increase, right, as say, um, you know, we're doled to the crappy things that happen throughout the day. We're thinking about them less, right, because the depressant effects of the alcohol um, do have some effect, right? But it's um, very, it's short lived and it becomes shorter and shorter lived uh, from there on out. Basically, nothing will ever be as good as that first drink because our body becomes more and more finely tuned to this poison and counteracting it. So, anyway, going back to this, I really have a dot here for like cons the consumption of drink one, but really it's kind of this is the process of consuming it, right? As we're consuming it and drinking it, we reach finally reach the state where. Uh, at this point, our body uh, has stimulated itself, right? It's our mind, our brain uh, has created stimulation to counteract the, the doling, depressant effect of the alcohol to reach, again, that state of equilibrium, right? It's countered the uh, negative or the, the depressant effect. So we no longer feel the high anymore. And in fact, what ends up happening is the depressant effect starts becoming less and less uh, influential in our system and the stimulating effects that our brain created and our body created to counteract the depressant effects of the alcohol, those stay though longer. And so what ends up actually happening is we become irritable uh, because we're overly stimulated, right? And so this is why we have to keep drinking, keep drinking, keep drinking, otherwise we'll become really irritable. Uh, and so again, once the sort of good effects of the, the doling sensation of the alcohol wear off because we're overly stimulated, well, we start to sort of, re, you know, decline. In fact, so let's say this was up here. Um, we have to start consuming them because we're going to go all the way down, in fact, down to here. Um, because it actually, after we experience the good associated with the Negatives associated with the overly stimulated uh, sensations that we have because of what our bodies naturally did to counteract the, the alcohol, that's far worse. It actually really drags us down. And so, like I said, we become far more irritable, um, antsy, anxious, um, snap at people and so on, right? Far more than we originally were inclined to be when we were, were at uh, the baseline, right? When we were sober. So what we end up doing then is we, well, boom, we start drinking again, right, to, to uh, counteract that or for whatever reason, right? And so as we start consuming another beer or whatever alcohol drink we're consuming, well, that starts to then offset the overly stimulated sensations we had, right? Or because we're now we're adding more of a depressant to our system. And so that's countering the overly stimulating nature. It's helping, right? It's helping alleviate the problems associated with our previous drinking. And that's one of the big themes in the literature is a lot of, especially for problem drinkers, a lot of the happiness or benefit they're gleaning from their drinking is really just off, an offsetting of the prior, the problems associated with their prior drinking. Anyway, so 
uh, again, we, we experience some relief, but then our body, because we're now introducing more depressant, right? Well, it starts uh, creating more uh, stimulants, right? So it, and what do I mean by that? You know, our heart rate increases and so on, right? So it starts um, creating stimula uh, stimulating effect to offset, again, the depressant effect, and we start feeling, right, less and less of that high, less and less good. And in fact, lo and behold, Again, too much stimulation, the beer or the alcohol wears off, right? The depressants wear off, the, sti the stimulating uh, factors that the body created as a response, those are longer lasting. And so we start feeling even worse again. So we're drunk, drunk down even further because, again, the stimulation that's created as a response is much longer lasting than the uh, depressant effects of the alcohol itself. So we're becoming more and more and more irritated, um, anxious, right, upset, generally unhappy as we proceed here. Right. So again, what do we have to do? Well, let's go ahead and start drinking that third one. Hopefully you kind of see what ends up happening here. Right. And so this is the kind of picture that uh, has helped me at least sort of capture what's going on when we consume alcohol. And again, a lot of that's largely based on the research I did and what these guys portray in, in their work. Um, so again, nothing is going to be quite as good as that first initial drink. Uh, you're always going to be chasing the high, so to speak, thereafter, right? because your body becomes more and more and more um, attuned to countering, uh, once it's, you know, confronted with alcohol, countering its effects. Okay. Also, you know, speaking to sort of this, what happens, you know, as we progress and drink more and more, think about, you know, if you've had five or six, like I have, you know, on occasion, right? Think about how bad you feel um, when you're out drinking, let's say, and all of a sudden no one else wants to keep drinking, right? And you, uh, if, if, if the alcohol's cut off for whatever reason, right, or people want to stop, uh, and you're down here, right, that's, you get irritated, right? You, you constantly are looking for the next drink. And, you know, I definitely can remember, you know, especially when I would binge drink or drink, you know, consume more, this, this constant need to make sure I had a drink, right? And so though I'm assuming that's probably true of a lot of us, given how alcohol works. And so think about that feeling, right? And how, how it feels when you are in the middle of, you know, a, a drinking session, you know, you're out with friends on a Friday night and how irritable you do feel, right? If you have to stand in a super long line or you haven't had a drink for a while, right? Well, that's because this sort of thing is going on physiologically behind the curtains, so to speak. Uh, so obviously one key factor in all this, uh, and so I mentioned how our body become, becomes more and more fine tuned to responding to the depressant effects of alcohol. And of course, that's a concept we're all probably familiar with known as tolerance. And the idea that again, what is tolerance? It's just basically our, our body over time becoming uh, more and more efficient of, at getting rid of the poison in this case, or getting rid of whatever substance we're talking about that you have a tolerance with respect to. So it's, as I put it in my notes, excuse me, it's your body working efficiently to counteract, in this case, a poison and return your brain chemistry to equilibrium. And so, so there's definitely this concept of tolerance. I mentioned how it's because of uh, this as well that, you know, much like this is true over one session of drinking, um, you know, this is kind of true over time with respect to drinking throughout your life. The, ex the experience, or um, maybe this isn't a perfect analogy, but the, like the happiness you experience from drinking, at least in my experience, again, maybe this is relative, is diminished over time. All right. I feel like when I first consumed alcohol way back in the day, all right, the high I experienced, so to speak, was a much more palpable uh, and appreciable versus, you know, over time it becomes less and less and less appreciable, which is one of the reasons, as I mentioned at the beginning, why this has been particularly of interest to me lately in my life. Right? Um, so not only does it get worse over time that night in a particular 
night of drinking, let's say, but over your lifetime, again, thanks to tolerance, right, it gets worse and worse and worse. So, and, you know, honestly, I've talked to my two oldest kids about this and I've, you know, explained it exactly like this and trying to point out, you know, of course, I'm not, you know, I don't do it like every day, like my mom did back in the day, right? But I'm trying to point out how exactly, you know, how this is and how, how it can be so enticing because, again, of that initial first experience, how it might seem, right, great, but nothing else is ever going to measure up to it. You know, whether it's that initial, you know, that in a night of drinking, you're never going to feel quite as good as the kind of the beginning, I would argue, in general, at least. And throughout one's lifetime in terms of their drinking, it'll never be as good as when you first started. And so kind of with that knowledge, and in fact, you're going to experience probably worse things as a result of the drinking, right? Your state will actually be worse off given time. You know, don't fall for it, right? Don't fall for that initial glimmer of you know, uh, goodness, right? It's it's an illusion given the grand scheme of things. Step back. And if you have a wider purview of what it's doing over time, whether with, with respect to one night's drinking or a lifetime of drinking, you'll realize, right, it's not worth it despite what seems to be, right, this initial high. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I think I said all that stuff I want to say. I do want to mention some interesting, so there's alcohol on the one hand, then there's caffeine on the other. And again, this is where I'm going to reiterate that I don't have a medical degree. I don't know, and I'm not a chemist. I don't know exactly how these things work, but I do have my own experience, extensive experience with both of these substances, alcohol and caffeine. And it's interesting to me, you know, I had a lot of reflections on caffeine as I worked through my thoughts on alcohol. All right, so let's mention some of the things I thought about. Let's keep this up here, I think. Um, similarities to caffeine, though. At least in terms of, you know, how there's that physiological process going on in our bodies. And so, too, how uh, we can form a kind of a psychological or subconscious addiction, right, to these substances. So similarities to caffeine. Which, in, for my part, I quit drinking soda. I used to drink a lot of Mountain Dew way back. Um, but sodas, at least, I actually do drink a root beer a night, but that has no caffeine. Uh, I used to drink soda back in the day, especially Mountain Dew. But I, I quit that, you know, 15 years ago at least. And so caffeine for me, most of my adult life, meant coffee. Okay, so um, I might say coffee instead of caffeine here and there. And so, again, um, coffee. So... Um, for me, it's, it's interesting how I've had a lot of, again, similar experiences with respect to alcohol, consuming it, and then withdrawing or stopping, right, refraining from consuming it, and then so too consuming caffeine or coffee, and then so too trying to withdraw or quit drinking, consuming co uh, coffee. Uh, and I think it's kind of like, it, it kind of provides like a mirror image of what's going on with alcohol, caffeine does, except it's like the opposite in my mind, right? Caffeine is like a stimulant. And so your body, what it immediately tries to do, okay, again, it wants equilibrium, you're already perfect. That's actually one of the themes that's going to be here, right? That we have to come to appreciate is that what our body is telling us is that things are already as good as they're going to, can be. We already have perfection, okay? Um, so stop trying to change it, right? But what happens, again, our body wants that state of perfection. It's going to try to retain equilibrium when we introduce any substance that's going to alter that, right? It's going to try to counteract that. And so in the case of alcohol, like we talked about, right, alcohol is a depressant. So the body stimulates itself, right? Increases the heart rate, so on and so forth. Well, when caffeine is introduced, it's the opposite. So caffeine stimulates us. So the body then right, tries to counteract that uh, in some sense, depressing us, I guess, if you will. Um, and, uh, or at least I think kind of how I thought about it was maybe not like depressing us. Uh, it doesn't create like these depressant effects, but what it does is it doesn't produce as much naturally, as much stimulation naturally as it otherwise would have, because it's got this artificial stimulation through the caffeine. At least that's how I worked through it in my mind. Uh, and you don't come to appreciate sort of how much 
coffee or caffeine actually affects you until you try to quit. Um, and when you do, uh, wow, you, you really recognize the effects. And like the next day after you, so let's say you do quit, right? Um, and then you, every once in a while, you, you drink caffeine or consume caffeine, but it's just a once every couple of months sort of thing. Then you can really reflect on and appreciate what this drug actually does and come to appreciate how it is, in fact, very much like alcohol. Because what happens to me, so I'll, I'll consume caffeine now. I quit caffeine. I should have started with all of it, you know, by stating that I quit caffeine a few years ago. Uh, but, and I'll get into that here in a moment. Um, but when I do consume caffeine, it's maybe, let's say, uh, once every couple months, I'll drink some coffee when I have a lot of grading. The thing I recognize and feel the most, that's most pronounced, is how I feel the next day. And in fact, it's so negative that it, it oftentimes I won't even want to drink coffee, even when I could use it to, to help grade. Uh, and that's because I feel so lethargic, right? It's like my body, right? It's the opposite of how I felt the previous day. And it's I, and again, I think it's because of the, how my body naturally reacted, right? It, it's depressing itself as a result of the overly, you know, overstimulation from the previous day or um, kind of the one of the, the ways I was working it out, as I mentioned earlier, is it's not creating what it naturally otherwise would have because of that artificial, artificial stimulation from the caffeine, right? It takes time to go back to producing what it naturally would, right? And as it's doing that, right, you're feeling lethargic, tired, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what I feel the next day. And so um, these guys talk about how, you know, the next day after drinking alcohol, again, you have excess stimulation, right? So you're still feeling irritable and so on. Uh, you know, you have that excess stimulation left over. Well, so too with caffeine the next day after consuming, if you don't consume it every day, otherwise you don't realize any of this, right? The next day, I feel extremely tired, right? It's like it was a depressant after effect, right? So again, very much like a mirror image to what's going on with respect to alcohol, I would argue. Okay. Um, so, you know, coffee, caffeine, like alcohol, it's so seductive, right? Because it does let us help us get stuff done, say, uh, on a particular day, right? Oh, it's so great. But um, the downside is, right, what happens the next day? Unless you drink more coffee. Right. And then what ends up happening? You're drinking it every single day, because if you don't, what ends up happening is exactly what I talked about. Right. You feel extremely tired. So you always I think that's a, a, a really good tool or tip to keep in mind when um, if you're trying to quit or cut back, no matter how good, uh, you know, it will seem today or tonight. Right. What are, what are you going to experience tomorrow? Right. And so, again, I will think about that right before I'm about to drink coffee. And I'm like, eh, I don't want to feel extremely tired all day tomorrow. Well, same thing with alcohol. Right. Oh, it would be good to sort of dull the pain, so to speak, and not worry about my problems. But if I do that, then I'm going to be like anxious and overly stimulated all day tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, again, we don't realize how powerful these drugs are until we take uh, long periods of time away from them. Right. And then go back and indulge every now and then, then you can really notice um, how significantly they really are altering our, our chemistry and um, in some sense our well-being. So as I have it here, coffee or caffeine is seductive and feels like a great stimulant until you quickly grow tolerant, right? And it just becomes an irritating habit and something you need. And that's precisely what it ended up becoming for me. Coffee, that is. I drank more coffee than anyone I know. I know. Uh, up until probably three years ago when I quit. I mean, I would literally drink a pot entirely myself of black, just straight coffee. Um, and, you know, it was bad. If I didn't, I would get headaches. I mean, I would, it would you know, I, I would have to drink it. Otherwise, I, I would experience withdrawal and um, really bad side effects. Um, so, you know, that summer, I think this is like the summer of 2017 or something like that. I, you know, again, totally unplanned. I was driving back from visiting a buddy in Chicago, got back really late that night, and I realized I haven't had any coffee today. Well, if I'm ever going to try, you know, cut back or quitting for a while, you know, this might be the time. Because usually any time I would take a day off from coffee again, I would ex experience really bad side effects. And so I, I realized, hey, I've already pushed through the first day with having none of it. Let's see what it's like. And so that was 
the whole point was that was ultimately the impetus for me finally stopping caffeine, um, which I, I, I guess, very powerful drug that I think is extremely, extremely um, underappreciated by most of us just because we're consuming it constantly all the time. And we, again, don't realize what it's doing to us, artificially inflating, again, these, this, the stimulation in our system. Uh, so quitting, right, and then now every once in a while indulging, you really do garner a greater appreciation for, again, just how much these things affect us. Okay, so we're tricked into these drugs and consuming them, given that initial high, that initial feeling, right? And then we're kind of just left chasing that thereafter, right? Okay, so I wanted to just mention a couple interesting observations that I had with respect to kind of what's going on with respect to alcohol in the process with respect to us, right, when we consume alcohol. So interesting observation number one, if you will, kind of this idea of tolerance. One thing I thought about is like, this is a measure of health, maybe. Like if you have, <laughs> I mentioned I have a higher tolerance, so of course I want to think that right, means I'm healthier. But um, is it the case that, and there's probably actually a scientific answer to this. I should have looked into it. Um, but is there something to this idea maybe that tolerance is an indication of health? Right, because it's your body responding to foreign substances, right, and trying to bring your your itself back to a optimal state, right, a state back to equilibrium. Um, so to me, it would seem like then the faster your body is doing that, the quicker it is, the more efficient at doing that that it is, right, the healthier you are. And again, what do we mean by counteracting those? substances that are introduced and bringing your body back to equilibrium, we mean tolerance, right? So, so anyway, interesting observation number one it is tolerance in some sense a reflection of, of one's health. And the more to, um, tolerance you have, is that in general like an indication that you're healthier? I don't know. So something I thought about. Interesting observation number two. I alluded to this earlier, I think, um, but I personally, and I, I know this is true of a lot of people too, that I get hot when I drink. Uh, that's one thing that always stood out, always sticks out in my mind is I, um, I will get hot. Uh, and that, you know, after doing the research and learning what I've learned, you know, that makes sense, right? Because again, what is your body doing uh, in response to the alcohol you, you've introduced and hence the depressants that you've introduced? It's going to try to stimulate itself, right? And so one of the ways it does that is, you know, again, increases heart rate and so on and so forth. And so uh, that all requires energy or heat. So you experience right that in the way of being hot. Um, so yeah, that, that was interesting to me, kind of making sense of how I, you know, always feel hot, you know, when I'm drinking or consuming alcohol. So interesting observation number three, this reflects, uh, actually a conversation with the same guy, uh, same dad who told me he has completed the 30 pack challenge twice in the last few years. And we were talking about, you know, blood alcohol content and tolerance and sort of the relationship between the two. And he was um, explaining to me how he just had realized recently how different these are. And, you know, I'd always kind of known, you know, that, um, you know, tolerance is one thing and blood alcohol level is another. But I, you know, our conversation reminded me just how important it is to kind of keep the difference in mind. All right. So, again, um, blood alcohol level, that's measuring how much of your alcohol percentage of it right it consists of alcohol um, now your tolerance is going to dictate right how given your particular percentage you know what sort of effects you will have right so somebody with a certain blood alcohol right if a high tolerance if they have a high tolerance for alcohol on a 0.08 level you might not be able to tell they they've consumed anything right they're driving completely normally um, they're speaking completely normally, et cetera, so on and so forth. But imagine someone with uh, no tolerance who never drinks at all, right? 0.08 level, right? They, they consume alcohol on this random day. A 0.08 level, you don't want to be encountering them on the road or anywhere probably, right? If they're even still standing and function. Um, so again, blood alcohol level, it's a kind of a more objective measure, right, of 
again, the percentage of your blood alcohol content that's, or blood content that's alcohol, right? Um, whereas tolerance, it's kind of a more subjective measure because it's, uh, again, it can vary. Even, even if we have the same experience, right, um, given that we have different bodies, right, so we've consumed the same amount of alcohol over the course of our lives, I might still have higher tolerance than you, right, um, for what, whether that's because I'm healthier or not, I don't know. Right, but uh, so that that's the the way in which I mean it's sort of subjective, right? Um, so definitely differences to be ascertained between BAC and tolerance, right? Versus blood alcohol content. Right? Um, and I will say, and we kind of chatted about this a little bit. Grant, so ideally, right? So we have DUI, huge problem associated with alcohol. And actually, one something I don't really even touch on much um, in in this. Um, so granted, that's a huge problem, you know, and we have to have some means to practically proceed, right? We have to work with what we can. So maybe it's the case that BAC is like the best we have, but given all these points about tolerance that I just mentioned, it would be nice if we could somehow, right? What we're really concerned with is not just this, right? Because now ideally I don't want either one of these drivers driving, right? The alcoholic or the person who's never drank at all, right, but, okay, but isn't this, right, so, in other words, we're hinting at tolerance here, isn't that a much bigger factor, a much more salient factor in terms of who we want on and off the streets, or who we want anywhere around us for that matter, right, isn't this, right, one's tolerance, and hence one's behavior, right, um, right, that's going to be the, what's affecting our, our behavior. Um, isn't that what we really care about and not necessarily this? Now, granted, anybody that's here, probably ideally, you know, we don't want them on the road. But if we had to pick, right, what we really care about is actually this, right? And um, we're really fearful of these people at this, right? And not so much the alcoholic. Granted, again, hey, how about you both stay off the road, right? If we had to pick one, I'd rather have the alcoholic right, on the road encountering me than someone who's never drank and is at a 0.08 level. Okay, so that was kind of sort of how our how alcohol, alcohol interacts with us physiologically. I also wanted to talk a, a lot about, I would say, um, the psychology of drinking. And so what I mean by that is kind of like what's going on, on a, at a subconscious level, right? So not at a rational, conscious, critical thinking level, you know, not the things, kind of things we're, we're, we're aware of at a conscious level, right? But all the things going on in the back of our minds that are working at a subconscious level. That's what I mean by, you know, the psychology of drinking, okay? At least what I hope to pick out, okay? So, again, I want to talk a little bit about the role and significance of the sub subconscious, right? Um, in other words, our habits, things that, you know, just like our breathing, when we breathe, it's not something we think about, right? It's something we do subconsciously. We don't have to consciously think in order to breathe. Uh, well, so too, there's all sorts of psychological laws or like um, patterns of behavior and thought connection and so on that work in a, in a subconscious sort of way, in a way that we're never consciously aware of. And uh, that is a huge factor in terms of our alcohol consumption and so too in terms of quitting or trying to cut back as all the literature or not all but um, that is a, a huge recurring theme in in the literature at least that i'm familiar with right is the role of the, the subconscious right the things sort of the habits we have that we aren't conscious of um, that have been built up over time as a result of our own behaviors right and maybe our own family members and habits and what do we do when we get together for Christmas and so on. You're always seeing your, your elders and um, drinking beer at these get togethers. Well, no wonder 20 years later, you're doing the same thing, right? And um, we always see it uh, in a positive light in advertising, right? Well, no wonder anytime, you know, we see alcohol, we have these suddenly, you know, these positive thoughts, you know, emerge. Uh, again, because it's been paired, right? These have been paired through advertising and so on 
and work on a sort of subconscious level. Or again, we're not thinking about this sort of thing, but it's affecting us just like we breathe without thinking about it. Okay? So that's what I mean to indicate by um, the role and significance of the subconscious in all of this. I know subconscious can be kind of a murky, murky term, so that's why I'm trying to flesh out what exactly do I mean by that, especially in this context when I'm, when I'm talking about. And so I will say, not only with respect to alcohol, but this is something that over my lifetime that I've come to appreciate is true in general, and that is the extent to which we are driven, not through conscious rational reflection, but by subconscious things we have no control over. Right? We like to think that we formed all of our opinions and stances through rational reflection, but the research shows right, that we have all sorts of biases uh, and that in fact, we're steered by primarily emotion, right? Or in other words, by things we're not rationally or consciously thinking about, i.e. the subconscious. Okay, so whether again, that's alcohol specifically we're talking about or things in general and the things we believe, right? So much of it is affected by and influenced by things we heard, we have no conscious awareness of. And of course that gets into issues like free will and so on, are we ever really free? But we don't have time to discuss that uh, during this episode. Um, but again, the degree to which we're not really consciously rationally in control of a lot of what we do, the degree to which that's true um, a lot of the time, that's become more and more uh, what's the word, uh, obvious to me, I guess, or something that I've thought more and more about uh, as I've gotten older. And so it's certainly true of alcohol, and that's what these authors also suggest, right? It is that Again, a lot of our behavior when it comes to alcohol is driven by our subconscious, you know, feelings that we have um, and that we're not maybe necessarily consciously aware of. So quitting, as I mentioned, is in part difficult oftentimes because of this sub subconscious, you know, the things working against us on a subconscious level. Okay, so that's my little spiel about the psychology of drinking and how much like is the case for us in general, a lot of what's true and happening uh, with respect to alcohol, right, um, is the case because of what's going on at a subconscious level, right? When we're on autopilot and not even thinking about things, right? We're just naturally automatically inclined to grab for a beer when the game is on, right? That sort of thing, this sort of automatic, habitual sort of response that's what I mean to, to indicate by what's going on at a subconscious, subconscious level. So that's my little spiel on that. And I think, again, I would agree with these authors that it's certainly at play with respect to alcohol. As I've argued, it seems to be the case in general for a lot of what we do. Okay, so I want to turn to a, an assessment of the utility of alcohol. So let's, and what I mean by that is let's try to do a quick measure or assessment of the catalog of, or catalog, let's say, the benefits and detriments of alcohol. So what are some of the pros? Let's start there. Well, again, this is from my perspective. So I tried to think long and hard about what was true of me, what I found to be the case. Right? And I would say it relaxes me mentally and This is how I would, whoops, not physically, socially. All right. So um, at least if I was pressed to say, you know, to identify positives, you know, why is it you drink, right? Especially after going through all this and realizing the bad stuff, you know, why is it you, you drink? Well, I would say because it relaxes me mentally, at least it seems to, right? And it relaxes me socially, or as some are apt to say, right? It's like a social lubricant. I think that's a big one, or at least has been a big one for me, right? I, um, my wife always says, well, nobody can ever tell. You seem, you never seem anxious in you know, groups and talking to people, but I feel like a lot of social anxiety at times, you know, and I, I, I teach classes and so you never know, right? But, um, you know, if I, I'm out for hours at an event, right? Um, yeah, I get anxious. And so I think a lot of it for me, when I would drink, it was because um, you know, it would relax me socially, so to speak. Now, so those are the two, right? So it kind of takes the edge off mentally, right? So in other words, let's say you were, um, had a lot of stress during the day. Um, the idea would be, right, 
um, something, you had a big argument with your wife or husband or significant other, you drink a few beers, oh, right, it doesn't bother you as much, or at least that's the way it seems. Okay, that's what I mean here. Relaxes me mentally, and then I talked about relaxing me socially. Now, immediately, I have to throw a huge caveat on these because, and this is actually one of the themes that was, was hammered home by Porter in particular, as well as the other two, but there's a huge caveat here, and that's, these are only gleaned, right? You only experience these if you continually drink, right? The second you stop consuming, right, this process is going to start, and you're going to start tanking and feel even more anxious, right? Because you're going to get overly stimulated. Your heart's going to be racing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whereas you were initially maybe, maybe, right, um, socially relaxed, if you stop drinking, you're, it's going to be way worse, all right? Um, especially the more you drink, as soon as you stop, right? Because your body's done so much artificial stimulation, right? That's going to be, it's built up an excess of that. That's going to last a long time. Um, it's not going to be good. You're going to be worse off, much worse off. Uh, you're going to experience a lot more anxiety than you would have initially otherwise. So maybe you, these pros, right? But I have to throw this huge caveat on, on these, and that's the if you're constantly drinking, you might experience these. Otherwise, your brain's going to counteract, right? If you if you don't drink fast enough or you stop drinking, again, your brain's going to counteract what was creating that good feeling, right? the doling of the, the worries and so on. And it's going to, through, through overstimulation, it's actually going to end up making you feel more anxious and worse. Right? So you're going to be more irritable, etc. So these are, the pros in my mind are only... If they're palpable at all, they're only appreciable insofar as you're constantly drinking. So they require constant alcohol consumption in order to glean these. Except for that, unless you want to say, well, that very initial little bit, fine, right? But if you want to try to keep anything in a sustained sense, you're going to have to constantly be consuming. Now, cons, there are so many uh, or different types and things that I, I kind of broke them down into like different aspects so like while you're drinking uh then like the next day and then long term right there's negative effects in all these senses so um physically like while you're drinking um so what's been true of me so i've reflected a lot of this you know especially as i've gotten older um almost immediately for me i start this wasn't this true when i was younger okay my body wasn't as efficient maybe as countering thing counteracting the poison and so on and you know, maybe I just had more energy back when I was younger, but at least as I've gotten older, what I will immediately feel, and it's a negative for me when I drink, is I'll get tired. I'll just feel tired, uh, unless I'm drinking a ton, right, and fast enough. The, the one beer, I'll just you know, feel tired, and the other main major thing that I almost always will feel is bloated in my stomach. It's beer, at least. I'll just feel full. Uh, and so, like, 30-pack? How, how can you drink 30 of these? I, mean, I, I, I feel bloated after one. Um, the other sort of big thing that, um, stands out in my mind is I rarely ever get headaches, but when I drink is when I'll get headaches. Um, you know, it's one to three beers in, I'll get headaches almost it's pretty routine too. Um, so obviously that's a, a pretty big negative. And, um, again, it is, maybe that's only true of me. I don't know, uh, which of these negatives you guys experience, um, when you're drinking, but these are the ones that are true of me. Now, again, I have a, always had kind of a higher tolerance. So the nausea, vomiting, et cetera, that's happened to me, but, you know, very rarely, and I can't even remember the last time that's happened, right? But, um, you know, all these are possible, so I'm just pointing that out. And then death's even possible. Now, that hasn't happened to me either, but uh, obviously death's possible from, you know, alcohol poisoning, and we hear about it you know, tragically, and especially college-age kids, but you hear all kinds of tragic, uh, you know, overdose stories with respect to alcohol. Uh, while you're drinking it mentally, uh, I've definitely, for me personally, noticed that uh, I get emotional, um, tend to uh, be more negative in some sense. Not not always, uh, but if there's something that's bad and going on, it will def I'll, it'll be definitely more dramatic. It'll become more dramatic. And it's not like I create drama and like, you know, this becomes a social issue and you know, start fights and stuff. But like I'm saying internally, right, I'll stew over things. 
Uh, and I've come to realize this and over time that if, if, you know, if I will experience this, I'll just tell myself, just go to bed. It'll be better, right? You'll wake up sober and feel, feel better. But so for me, mentally, there's definitely, um, again, not always, but if something negative happens, it becomes very much, uh, uh, magnified. That's a good way to put it. Uh, and will be much more dramatic when I've been drinking. Okay. And again, it's not something that's creating issues with others, but it's something that, uh, is going on internally for me. And then naturally, obviously we do stupid stuff, right? Our, we're doubling not only our emotions, but like our rational faculty. So we don't really think when we're drinking, uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, now I have, you know, that's not to say like, you know, I have memories of, you know, I've certainly like written and done creative stuff, you know, while drinking and you know, played guitar and done all kinds of things while consuming alcohol. But by and large and in general, I would say our creative, rational capacities are certainly blunted, um, which I think is a negative uh, through alcohol consumption. Right? We don't think it's critically and we're just stupid a lot of times. Uh, and I have a couple of examples, actually, of experiences that I've had, um, you know, that have, that weren't me being stupid, but were others uh, that affected me um, to just kind of highlight how we get stupid. And again, not to suggest that you're just not going to hear about the stupid things I've done, right? But not to suggest I'm innocent because I have certainly done really stupid things, again, through not thinking clearly because of, you know, alcohol. So one example I have is... Uh, you know, I still have a vivid memory of being in downtown Kansas City. I can't remember what we were celebrating, but it was late at night. And so we were walking back to someone's car. And uh, the couple I was, I mean, this is late. It's like one o'clock or something in the morning. And uh, the couple I was with wanted to stop at this hot dog stand and get a hot dog. And so I'm just standing there waiting. Next thing I know, here comes this early 20s year old guy and, you know, a group of early 20 year olds. And, uh, this girl falls down and, you know, unfortunate or whatever. And this guy, he just says, nobody's, nobody's going to laugh at that. Right. And, you know, I happen to be right there and I'm like, and he, I don't know what the issue was or what he thought. Uh, but I, he must, he, he interpreted my response in a negative way. And next thing I know he's in my face and pushed me. And I literally said nothing or did nothing. Um, again, I don't know if he read my body language wrong, in a certain way or what, but next thing I know, I'm, flying backwards. And again, this is, I have four kids, right? And I, I started to think about this coming into this episode. I don't remember ever throwing a punch at anyone in my life. So I'm getting a father of four, right? On the way back to the car, uh, getting pushed and I'm getting up and he literally punched me then, uh, in the jaw. Uh, and I was, I dumbfounded. I, you know, I had been drinking. And so fortunately, all these kinds of thoughts come from my mind, you know, you can't get involved. You can't, you know, who knows what he, he could, he could destroy me. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, I'm much older, probably he's probably stronger friends. So I don't want to get involved. Uh, I don't like violence anyway. Right. So all these things are running through my mind. I'm reflecting on this. What do I do? I ultimately ended up just like being baffled and I was obviously really ticked off and yelling and be like, what, and what are you doing? And, uh, one of the girls, he was with like, was very apologetic, like, oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, it was his 20, 21st or something birthday. And so that excuses, you know, this behavior. So you can just go around punching people. But they were, you know, the others he was with was very apologetic. But well, I'm bringing all this up because it's a clear instance of, um, you know, I never did anything about it. We just ended up walking to our car. And, um, you know, I still think about it a lot. But, you know, I didn't pros- uh, press charges or pursue anything legally. But, uh, Obviously, you know, something significant uh, that I think about and reflect about, reflect on a lot. And a similar story, also, you know, parent of four kids, three or four kids when this happened, uh, you know, we're at a, a bar uh, and I'm in a, in a line, a long line to get alcohol. I don't know what drink I was on, right? But I'm probably starting to get anxious because it's a long line and start to get to the front. And suddenly this shorter guy, I mean, in terms of, again, I don't like violence, but this guy was much smaller than me, right? Just cuts right in front of me. And I was just flabbergasted. And he turns to me and looks at me and says, you got a problem? I just got out of prison. I was like, as much as I want to say, get the hell, you know, what are you doing? 
like I, I couldn't believe like that he had the gall to do that. Uh, you know, I had the foresight. I don't know what it is. Right? I hadn't drank too much at that point. And, you know, who knows? Uh, one of the things I thought about when I was reflecting on these for this episode is what had happened. What would have happened if I had consumed a few more beers at the point that these two things happened? Right? These two different scenarios had happened. Would I have reacted differently? Uh, but what I do remember, I remember vividly, you know, what he said and kind of my thought process, you know, as much as I wanted to just, you know, because I've always been like justice, right? I mean, people should get what they deserve. And, you know, this was not just, this was not fair. It took everything in me to just, you know, tell myself, you have kids at home, right? Whatever is not worth it, right? It's not worth even, I didn't even say anything back to him. You know, all these things went rushing through my mind, but I didn't say anything and uh, just let him go you know like what can i do and so the whole point you know me bringing these up is obviously there goes reason when you're consuming alcohol right and fortunately i still had personally i still had some of it left to you know not react in certain ways and so i've always wondered again what if i you know had been, had consumed a little bit more would things have worked out differently or what if someone else was in that situation who doesn't reflect about these kinds of things right when you, when you hear about all kinds of tragedies right or a parent a father of four killed in a tragic you know drunken brawl well that's the sort of scenario where again i very easily could have been in but uh fortunately still had enough you know reflection in me to to realize it wasn't worth it but again was i lucky was i just lucky um i don't know so those kinds of um scenarios that have happened to me have really had a profound effect on me to the point where i think seriously about ever going out especially when there's alcohol involved, when I know there's going to be heavy alcohol um, drinking, just because it's hard enough to control yourself when you're drinking, but you can't control others when they're drinking, you know, especially when they're drinking. You can't control others, others, especially when they're intoxicated. So, and we've, you know, I've already went through all the bad stuff that happens or some of it you know, as we're drinking, including, right, this stunting of our emotional and rational capacities. So, um, is it even worth going out anymore? I mean, I, I really don't. Uh, and that's probably a large reason why, of course, having four kids makes it pretty difficult, but, um, that's that. So how about affects the next day? And as I think I mentioned already earlier, thinking about the ill effects that can come after, right. Is after a day of drinking is one of the most useful tools I think, or tips I would have in terms of trying to cut back or quit when it comes to your alcohol consumption. Think about, for example, how tired and lethargic you are the next day. At least this is, again, I was reflecting back on my experiences. This is the things that are most pronounced for me. I feel like tired, lethargic the entire day, um, without fail pretty much, as long as I've had more than a couple beers or a couple drinks the previous day, I will feel basically worthless um, the entire next day. It will probably be a miracle if I get a workout in. And I'm one who really tries to work out almost every day. So it's an uphill battle for sure if I consumed alcohol the, the previous uh, previous night or previous day. Um, and then think about on the, you know, the bad end of the spectrum, you could be still throwing up, extremely nauseous. And I'll get, not necessarily a negative, but I'll get like really hungry for like greasy food, probably because of I guess the negative there would be your stomach's not all right, completely right. You are a little bit nauseous. Um, so again, next day, a lot of times, whether it's coffee or alcohol, that thought, thinking about the next day is really what uh, will prevent me from consuming either, on, at least on occasions. Now, what about the long-term effects, right? So we went through um, like the negative effects mentally and physically. As you're drinking, the crappy effects the next day. And of course, I would I should have said like the mental right side of things isn't going to be good the next day either. Right. So in addition to being tired, tired and lethargic, you're probably going to be overly stimulated, right? Anxious, irritable, snappy. Okay? Definitely seems to be true in my experience anyway. But what about the long term effects? So we're probably most of us are pretty familiar that alcohol does have some you know ample long term effects associated with it liver issues, heart disease, heart issues, strokes, cognitive decline, et cetera, et cetera, right? Indeed, there's a long list of physical problems associated with long-term alcohol consumption, right? Ranging from those well-known liver issues that most of us are familiar with 
to all kinds of more subtle and nuanced issues that we might not at first glance associate with alcohol consumption. Things like low energy, low libido, uh, really the list is endless. And I would argue then probably even some effects that are heretofore uh, not known to be related to alcohol, right? Negative stuff will probably come to light as we move forward as well. So just given the nature of it, um, that's my intuitive sense is that we maybe haven't even learned the half of it when it comes to these negatives. Yeah. Uh, another huge negative long-term is that it can be expensive. So um, I mentioned, right, an all-time high, or uh, my alcohol consumption, rather. Uh, I did the math. If you assume it's $1.67 per drink, right, say $10 per six-pack, and I drink, drink uh, roughly a six-pack every time I drink, well, I spent on average, what was it, $84.32 each month on alcohol over this time period, which works out to about $1,000, $1,011.84 every year over these five years of data that I have for me. Okay. And, you know, that's probably true of most of my adult life, uh, lifetime. It was probably worse, you know, the earlier in my adult life lifetime, right? So in my 20s, I probably drank slightly more maybe. All right, so the best case scenario is I'm spending 1000 plus every year. I remember former students, some, um, the non-traditional, I remember this conversation with one non-traditional student one time where he said he would go out, he and his wife, the only things they would spend money on is when they would go out on the weekends. They would blow like almost a thousand on a, on a weekend. I, I couldn't believe it. But So so apparently it can be way worse than my thousand dollars in a year. You could blow a thousand dollars basically on alcohol, you know, in the bars and whatnot. On a, in a weekend, especially depending on where you're at. Um, actually, so I have a note here. One of my all-time highs uh, was my wife and I, we went to a Padres game last summer. And for two drinks, granted they were like, you know, nifty, nifty little drinks, um, mixed drinks. I ended up paying after tax $55 for two drinks. So needless to say, this stuff can certainly be expensive. And how about in terms of long-term effects? Things like productivity and how much that suffers. Right. How much of a, how many of us think about how crappy our work is as a result of alcohol consumption? You know, over time, how much is that actually affecting us? And a lot of us are functional alcoholics, or some of us like to think that we're functional alcoholics, or that it's maybe not affecting us. But in the back of your mind, you have to acknowledge that you're probably not as optimal as you could be, right? You're granted maybe you're still getting by and you're still producing something. Is it truly as optimal as it could be? It's probably not. Right. So I would argue productivity, whether it's the next day or over repeated instances of alcohol use, you know, just throughout your regular everyday existence. If you're routinely consuming alcohol, I would argue productivity is probably suffering on an everyday sense. Um, so how many how many of us think about that sort of thing? What about setting goals, much less pursuing them? Right? That becomes immensely more difficult if you're consuming alcohol, especially on a regular basis. Right. Who's concerned with improving? Right. Um, who's really thinking about that sort of thing when under the influence, especially routinely. So uh, lots of in terms of the utility of alcohol, you know, I tried to suggest the pros, um, at least, you know, why was it? Or why is it that I drink, you know, the ones that seem to occur to me? And then I also mentioned right, the ample negatives then and all the you know, sort of the different manners in which they're negative, right? During during the actual drinking, the next day, the long-term effects, and so on. So that said, I wanted to take a moment here in part seven and juxtapose, having gone through all of these effects, mostly negative with respect to alcohol, juxtapose alcohol then with marijuana. Um, now, this has been routinely done uh, for a while now, right? Through for, for many decades, you know, I've, at least as I've grown up and throughout my lifetime, uh, you know, alcohol and marijuana have repeatedly been compared and contrasted. And so this will, you know, should come as no surprise then probably to, to many of you that I'm doing that as well here. Um, and again, given the foregoing analysis, given a lot of the negatives I'm enumerated, I have enumerated, not to mention, by the way, um, how about addiction? Right. I mentioned all the long term effects, but what about addiction itself? Right. You could becoming physically addicted to the substance. Uh, right. We are all familiar with alcohol addiction and, and its prevalence and the significance of it. 
given all these mostly negative, I would say, often significant effects associated with alcohol, right? And given that it's still legal, and given um, the lack of, you know, as many at least negative effects seemingly, and also given some of the positives, some of the medicinal benefits often associated with marijuana, and given then that it's illegal, right? Shouldn't we ask, well, why? You know, why is it the case that alcohol is legal while at the same time marijuana is illegal? And at the outset here, when you're sort of approaching this juxtaposition and this comparison here, and if any, either one should be legal, uh, which should it be? Or if either one should be illegal, which should it be? Or maybe they should both be one or the other. You know, at the outset, I think it would behoove us to, you know, if you're not already a parent, imagine you are a parent or you know, you, maybe you will be. Right. As a parent, which, you know, would you, just in the face of things, which would you rather catch your children doing? Uh, consuming alcohol or consuming marijuana? Uh, personally, I definitely know the answer to that. Uh, and I know my wife's answer to that as well. Right. We're all familiar with, and I've alluded to drunk driving, right? the whole slew, again, of negatives associated with alcohol. Uh, the most extreme being death. Compare that with marijuana. Um, Granted, you might do some stupid things, right? But very few times do you hear, if and ever, right, marijuana being listed as the cause of death. Right? Um, again, who, who would you rather uh, encounter, right? A group of drunk people, right, or a group of stoners? You know, what can you expect? What are the negatives? Let's let's go back to the parenting, right? What are the negatives associated with with marijuana? Um, some of the, the negatives, right? We hear about the munchies, right? Wanting to eat a lot, um, whether there's truth to that or, or not, who knows? And maybe that's, again, maybe a lot of our experience with marijuana and maybe drugs in general, just like was the case with alcohol, maybe it's relative, right? So maybe it's not one and the same for for everyone. It's probably not one and the same, but in general, right? What are some of the, the, the negatives we hear attached to marijuana? Well, it makes them lazy. Now, whether or not that's true or not, right? Let's just set that aside. Let's say it does make people lazy. And hence, if you catch your kids smoking pot or consuming marijuana, may, they're going to be lazy. Let's say that, um, right? Uh, they, they get the munchies. They're going to be eating a lot. Right, are these, so, so these are some of the negatives. But again, you don't really fear death, right? That's literally one of the fears, um, associated with alcohol. And it's not like it's just, well, it happens every once in a while. No, I mean, routinely here, in fact, think about it this way. When you hear about some, especially late at night, some tragic accident, don't you often find yourself immediately jumping to the question of well, how much that they had or were they under the influence, right? You immediately sort of question, right, if, if these very egregious things happen or if there's a tragic you know, accident late at night. What's the first thing you, you jump to? Probably alcohol involved. Uh, if there's a, a bad brawl, right? Again, especially late at night. What's the first thing you assume? Oftentimes, alcohol, right? Uh, so for all those reasons, again, as a parent, um, I'll give you that maybe, you know, marijuana makes them lazy. I'll take a lazy um kid that is, is, you know, has the munchies all the time over a dead kid, right? So again, at the outset, as a parent, intuitively, on the face of things, however you want to put that, right? It seems to me that I would much rather, you know, I would, um, ideally, they'll wait till, what is it, 25 until the brain is supposedly fully uh, formed. But hopefully, you know, my children will wait until then to indulge in these substances if they ever do. Uh, but if I happen to catch one or more of them indulging in them earlier, I, again, personally would rather, much rather that be marijuana than alcohol. Uh, I also think it's interesting. Well, let's consider it from the DEA's perspective. Um, you know, in terms of, so you oftentimes will hear about this, right? The uh, marijuana is still a Schedule One drug, right? So let's let's talk about the scheduling of these um, substances of these drugs, and the fact that alcohol is not even scheduled, right? So we have marijuana still as a, listed as a Schedule One drug, but let's let's go through the the DEA's criteria for 
labeling a drug as such, and then ask ourselves right, as rational critical thinkers, which one is properly labeled as a schedule one drug, marijuana or alcohol, or maybe neither, or maybe both, right? So what is the DEA's current criteria for uh, labeling a drug, uh, classifying a drug as a schedule one drug? And I will say, I remember this being like three criteria, and I always thought it was weird because I don't remember what they were specifically, but two of them always seem the same. And so <clears throat> fast forward to now, when I was preparing for this episode, I got this from the DEA's website by the way, now there's just two uh, primary criteria. So I'm not surprised that it went down to two because like I said, the second and third from back in the day, they always seem kind of similar to me. So what are these two criteria? So well, let's just read the definition here from the DEA's website, okay? So, quote, schedule one drugs, substances, or chemicals are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So, and both of them, right? So we have Let's get a better marker here. We have a bad marker. So one, no medical. Oh, maybe this is part of the issue, right? Maybe this is the issue. No currently accepted medical use. currently accepted by whom, rather, right? Well, no currently accepted medical use is one of the, the criterion. What's the other one? High potential for abuse. Let's go through each of these in turn. First, accepted medical use. And remember, it's got to be both. There's an and in there. So we've got to check out both these to label a drug, substance, or chemical as Schedule 1, okay? Let's ask ourselves about its accepted medical use. Now, I will in a moment, uh, I didn't label or identify any of these as, uh, or any positive, right, health benefits associated with alcohol because I honestly don't think there are any. Um, and so that's why I didn't label or mention any earlier, but I'll mention here in a moment some of them that are supposed to exist, right, some, some, uh, sort of health benefits. But again, I would argue alcohol, if we're being honest, um, and again, how much of the average, uh, research can we trust given that there's been some shady things going on in the past, right, versus, with respect to, say, cigarettes and were they bad for us and sugar and, and so on. Um, but I would argue there's little, if any, discernible benefit, right, medical benefit from consuming alcohol. So alcohol lacks this. I would say alcohol. So we would check the box off for alcohol. Now, so let's do this for alcohol first. What is the currently accepted medical use for, for alcohol? Um, other than like, okay, let me take that back. Like, uh, to an, an, uh, like a pain, a pain uh, medication, right? But we have better alternatives, right? But so, so I, could, I grant that, you know, if some the patient's going to be experiencing pain, you could give them say alcohol, and that would help numb the pain. But beyond, beyond that, I don't think there's really any, um, and, and, and even granted that, right, there's better alternatives. Uh, so I don't think there's really any actual medical use for, for alcohol in terms of our well-being. Number two, high potential for abuse. Can anyone deny that alcohol is highly, highly, highly addictive? So it seems to me alcohol fits both of the criteria listed. Now let's go through for marijuana. As the rational critical thinkers we are, All right? Let's go through each of these. Medical use, as I suggested way earlier, I don't think I think it's a lot harder nowadays to suggest there's no accepted medical benefits associated with cannabis with, with marijuana. After all, it's not only legal, you know, medicinally, but recreationally some places, right? But in a whole a variety of states have legalized it for precisely this, this reason medicinal usage. So I think that's a very weak argument if somebody tries to suggest that marijuana uh, has no accepted medical use. I think you can't make that argument really anymore. So for me, marijuana fails to check that one off already, since you're both required to be seemingly, given the, the word wording here, both required to be labeled as a Schedule One drug according to the DEA. 
marijuana already fails since it does not satisfy that condition. But what about high potential for abuse? I don't, I mean, in my personal experience, I don't see it. I haven't come across, you know, much in the research that suggests, now I, there is such a thing as, you know, I, what do they say, psychological addiction to marijuana. But let's, you know, at least comparatively, it's certainly, you know, to a lot of these other drugs, alcohol included, um, there's no potential for abuse in a comparative sense. Um, now, I will grant, again, that certainly for some, like arguably anything, right, you can overdo it. So some people could certainly abuse marijuana. But in the sense that you're causing problems, right, that you're you know, dying, um, you're literally losing job, your job family, et cetera. I just don't see that with marijuana. Like say you see it with other drugs like alcohol. So, I mean, and if, if throwing the, the high here, high potential, I just don't see that for marijuana. You, maybe I could see some arguments for potential, right? Definitely potential for abuse, but high potential, no. So whereas alcohol seems to uh, check off both of these, marijuana doesn't. And yet, which one is still to this day, uh, labeled as a Schedule One drug by the DEA, marijuana. And curiously, I couldn't help but notice on that DEA website, on the page where I got all this information, uh, alcohol wasn't actually even mentioned once. They they rattled off, they mentioned all kinds of various drugs. Alcohol was never mentioned once. So again, that was from www.dea.gov slash backslash slash, sorry, backslash drug information backslash drug scheduling if you're curious and want to look more into that also point out or point out that um look at our immediate reaction to both these substances alcohol and one of the reasons why to me i, I think of it as a poison our body immediately tries to expel it right and immediately upon ingesting it it's trying to flush it out of our system whereas our Bodies actually have cannabinoid receptors. Uh, back in the day, I actually dug this up um, way back. This is old, old school undergrad. University of Nebraska Carner, Carney for uh, for uh, Dr. Wayne Briner. Shout out to Dr. Briner out there. But uh, this is actually the paper I wrote. And this was on more of the um, sort of sciencey aspect of marijuana. I've actually subsequently written... At the University of Kansas, I wrote a paper on the utility of marijuana prohibition. So I have written academically uh, on the topic of you know marijuana. Just, I've done you know talked about you know, not ar marijuana and alcohol before and juxtaposed them before in an academic sense. Um, but so I and I used to know more about the physiological processes, you know, and these cannabinoid receptors and so on. But the whole point I'm raising here is that our bodies actually have these receptors in us for these cannabinoids, right? So it would seem to suggest, right, that the THC in pot then is natural, or else why do we have receptors for it, right? It seems, um, you know, as opposed to something like alcohol, which again, our body immediately s s seeks to expel, it's almost like the opposite's going on with something like THC, because again, we have receptors for these cannabinoids. Um, so again, that was always, that's something that kind of, struck me as interesting or curious take i've mentioned this a few times but you know i can't get over the fact that you know alcohol is and can be and frequently is lethal right whereas you know you you might have heard as i've often heard um people you know asking have you ever heard of it you know anyone overdosing on pot you just don't hear about it but you hear about it all the time with alcohol and you hear about you know, tragic, again, tragic accidents and deaths all the time associated with alcohol, whereas that does not seem to be the case, at least not near as often, if it is the case, not near as often with respect to marijuana. So, again, why is, I can't help but ask, you know, being the curious fella I am, why is it that marijuana is illegal and alcohol isn't? You know, if the one is going to be, if alcohol is going to be legal, then it seems to me marijuana should also be legal. Or conversely, if marijuana is illegal, then it seems like alcohol should be illegal. Um, you know, uh, or maybe even more ideally, marijuana should be illegal and alcohol should be illegal. I don't know. I'm actually, one of the things I'll say here in a moment is how I'm 
not one for government intervention. So I'm not one to make things illegal. So I would be more inclined to say or suggest, you know, why is marijuana illegal rather than maybe we should make alcohol illegal, right? Why is alcohol illegal? No. Why is marijuana illegal still? So why is it that it's still illegal, right? Federally, um, why is it the DEA, DEA is still suggesting, DEA is still suggesting that marijuana is a schedule one drug, that there's no medicinal benefits associated with it? Why do all these powers that be seem to be dragging their feet, right? Um, and if you think about it, at least in my experience, there seem to be very few that I encounter who think the pot should still be illegal. I don't know anyone, honestly, uh, at least that, that I'm aware of that is for marijuana being illegal. I take that back. There's one um, fellow instructor at Johnson County Community College who has some papers, has written some papers on um, marijuana and why it should be uh, still prohibited. Um, Sands, that instructor, uh, I don't know of anyone. And seriously, I encourage you to think about it. Who do you know who still thinks it should be illegal? And yet here it is, still a crime. Um, federally, right? And I've been hearing about, you know, for decades, oh, it's, there's progress being made, right? And, you know, we're all, you know, legalization is going to happen. It's going to happen. Yet it's been for decades, you know, when, why has it taken that long? Like what, what's going on here? Um, I don't want to get too political or cons conspiratorial here, but that, namely that it's a political conspiracy, seems to be exactly what's going on. I mean, nothing else makes sense given all the things I just went through, right? We, nothing else could explain um, why when alcohol is legal, marijuana is still illegal, um, again, given all the things we went through. Now, I will say, ironically, um, and somebody just mentioned this to me, otherwise I would have had no idea. Um, I tend to stay away from mainstream media now. So um, apparently the House, though, uh, just passed legislation to legalize marijuana federally but we'll see what comes of that, right? It'll probably be another seven years before the next step's taken. I, I don't know. Uh, again, I've been hearing how, you know, it's going to happen. I've been hearing that for, for decades. So um, to the point where it's this, this oddity with respect to alcohol being legal and marijuana being illegal has been one of the, the things that's really made me um, question, you know, the powers that be and what's really going on. And, uh, just that it has taken this long with something so obviously, you know, that seems seems so innocu innocuous um, to me, at least. And it's, it seems to be obviously that. Uh, and yet you have something like alcohol that can be extremely the opposite. Right. The the paradox, right, that, that the one's legal and the other's yeah, illegal, I, that that has never uh, made much sense to me. And it's been, as I was trying to suggest here, it's um, made me really question, again, the powers that be, the government, you know, why is this the case? I don't, I, I don't understand it. It's always been extremely perplexing to me. So anyway, uh, I, oh, some, some context here, um, some numbers. So, you know, I thought I should have probably started off by um, rattling this off, but only 12%, only 12% um, of Americans said they smoke. So, you know, what's the context of this 12%? This is from a Gallup poll, by the way. I think it was from 2019. Uh, when they took this, 12% of Americans said they smoke marijuana. So whether that's once a day, once a week, once a year, I don't know. But that's the number I came across. Um, and again, that was from a Gallup poll. While 55% of uh, Americans had said they consumed alcohol in the past month, according to the NIAA A, that we referenced earlier, that institute. Uh, they said, so that National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, I think it was, their number was 55% of uh, 18 and older have consumed in the past month, they said, right? people that responded. Um, but I, Porter, William Porter, in his book um, said it was 87% of Americans drink alcohol, 86% rather. That was from page 63. I have the number right here uh, from this one. So, you know, how, how do you want to construe those numbers? Again, 55% of Americans at least in the past month 
you know, have consumed alcohol. And then Porter suggests 87% of Americans consume alcohol. And again, I don't know. He didn't state the frequency that that, that applied to. But uh, the whole point here is that uh, alcohol is consumed much more frequently by by many more people. Uh, so I find that interesting and wanted to give a little bit of context there for that in terms of that number. So I referenced sort of some shadiness and I, I wanted to point that out again that uh, with respect to some of the benefits, right, and some of the ways that alcohol, so some of the benefits associated with alcohol sometimes and some of the ways alcohol is characterized seems rather shady to me. And uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's kind of reminiscent of, um, you know, how, you know, research was at previous points with respect to things we know are definitively terrible for us now, like cigarettes and sugar and so on. Right. I, I wonder if the same thing isn't still going on with respect to alcohol. And maybe it's a matter of time before we figure out that lo and behold, there really are no positives at all associated with alcohol. And it's really terrible for you. And it, you know, it takes off years and years of our life. So, so uh, I, the, the upshot or what I'm hoping to emphasize here is again, um, some of the stuff with respect to alcohol, the, these alleged benefits and um, sort of the way it's characterized seem a bit suspect or shady to me. So where, for instance, I referenced the NA, wait, NIAAA's number of fit, you know, 55% of Americans in the past month have consumed alcohol. Well, where are the other 45%? They don't seem to be around here because I'll tell you the percentage of people, at least that I'm encountering, it's way more than 55% that have consumed in the last month. You know, I would say it was like 90 something. Um, in fact, if I were to, have, you know, question everyone I come across, you know, that I talk to, I don't know of anyone that would probably say they hadn't drank or consumed alcohol in the last month, other than myself, right? Other than me. Um, so where are these, where are these people? Now, other than my mother and my father-in-law, they, you know, again, I don't even know the last time my mom consumed. So, She's an anomaly, setting her aside, right? And setting my father-in-law, he actually doesn't consume alcohol very often, uh, maybe like once a year that I've seen. Um, setting that 0.000001% that I know aside, you know, everyone else consumes. So these numbers seem a little, I don't know, they don't seem accurate, at least in my experience. So again, maybe that speaks to instead the relative nature of, my, of our own experiences. Uh, maybe this is accurate, and, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of people drinking is just, that's just true of my own relative experience and the people I know. I don't know. Uh, listen to, though, the rather rosy depiction of alcohol on Wikipedia. And granted, Wikipedia is not some um, authority or anything, right? But it's arguably the first place a lot of us go to, including me when I'm preparing for some of this stuff, right? So how does Wikipedia, one of the first places that many people will go, including children, when inquiring into alcohol, what does Wikipedia have to say? Quote, it is one of the oldest and most common recreational substances causing the characteristic effects of alcohol intoxication, drunkenness. Among other effects, alcohol produces happiness and euphoria, decreased anxiety, increased sociability, sedation, impairment of cognitive memory, motor, and sensory function, and generalized depression of central nervous system function, end quote. So uh, most of that sounded really pretty good. Right. Where's the mention of addiction, uh, drunk driving, death, right, liver and heart disease? That, that's not there. Uh, why not? So, you know, these kinds of depictions seem to me kind of irresponsible and misleading, you know, almost disingenuous. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't want my kid to, to have their impression of alcohol be formed on this. I mean, this is very troubling to me. Um, you know, if you're going to include this, fine, but at least go rattle through all of the negatives as well. Now, I also want to, uh, I wanted to mention the Mayo Clinic, and I will concede that the Mayo Clinic, at least, they did kind of downplay the, the possible benefits that they mentioned on their site, um, but they still mention possible benefits and so on. But I wanted to mention, uh, at least state that they, they do take some steps to, like, mention that there are always risks involved with consuming alcohol and so on. But listen to what even the Mayo Clinic, this is mayoclinic.org, what they have to say about alcohol. Quote, 
If you're a light to moderate drinker and you're healthy, you can probably, and listen to these Weaslers. There's a lot of these Weaslers. So if you took my logic critical thinking course, we'd talk about all kinds of fallacies, things you want to be on, or rhetorical devices, things you want to be on the lookout for. And one of them are Weaslers, words or phrases that are thrown in that, uh, that allow the person to imply something much stronger than what they're actually committing themselves to. So when you say things like probably, perhaps, you know, generally, these things are all allowing you to weasel your way out if pressed, right? So you're not actually committing to what most people are going to take from what you're saying, okay? So uh, again, I wanted to mention that. So if you're a light to moderate drinker and you're healthy, you can probably continue to drink alcohol as long as you do so responsibly. What is responsible alcohol consumption? I'm really starting to wonder what that looks like. Uh, more from the Mayo Clinic here. Moderate alcohol use for healthy adults generally means up to one drink a day for women and up to two drinks a day for men. Well, that doesn't sound so bad. So moderate alcohol. So I'm actually moderate, right? I mentioned how I had the numbers up there, but it was slightly more, you know, it was in between one and two. I averaged in between one and two drinks a day. That's moderate. Not so bad. And here before, given these other numbers and depictions, I was extremely worried. The Mayo Clinic, given their verbiage, I'm not quite as worried now. So again, moderate alcohol use for healthy adults generally means up to one drink a day for women and up to two drinks a day for men. Pros and cons of moderate alcohol use. And so they proceed to, to list them. Moderate alcohol consumption, so again, this is all quoted from their site. Moderate alcohol consumption may provide some health benefits, such as reducing your risk of developing and dying of heart disease, which I'm confused about because one of the negatives you often encounter are all kind of associated with you know, long-term effects of alcohol is heart issues. And yet here we have reducing your risk of developing and dying of heart disease associated, by the way, with very light alcohol. Some people suggest that this is the case, right? Again, confusing given all the negative heart issues also associated with alcohol. So we have reducing your risk of developing and dying of heart disease, Two, possibly reducing your risk of ischemic stroke when the arteries to your brain become narrowed or blocked, causing severely reduced blood flow. That's what it means. And then possibly reducing your risk of diabetes. Right. Listen to the way it's couched. Why even? Uh, again, they, they, they did a fair job like pointing out, you know, there's always risk involved and so on and so forth. But uh, it just seems to me like the people trying to build a case, you know, for the positive benefits of alcohol consumption, especially for our health, they're really reaching. I mean, and you, you know, all things, kinds of things are possible. It could possibly lead you to win the lottery. It could possibly lead you to meet your future wife. It could also possibly lead to your death, right? And that's much more likely. Uh, so I, there just seems to be something inadequate that strikes me inadequate as inadequate about a lot of the ways alcohol is depicted and described. Um, okay, so that was a little aside, if you will, I guess, a little juxtaposition of alcohol with marijuana, marijuana, um, you know, and I don't know if there's any rational explanation for why the one is legal and the other one's illegal. I don't know that I'll, again, ever be able to make sense of that. But I want to move on <clears throat> to the last part before I get off the philosophical fence, uh, and that would be quitting alcohol, or not, maybe not quitting alcohol, but I want to say a few things about reducing our alcohol consumption. So, so, um, so in other words, I want, to, I want to speak to either reducing or quitting alcohol altogether, reducing our consumption or quitting alcohol altogether, um, <clears throat> because that's actually a lot of what, naturally, they're speaking to a lot of alcoholics in these books, and so a lot of what they're saying is geared to naturally then helping, right, quit. Uh, and so, you know, I took away from a lot of that reading then different strategies and observations they had and tools and so on. And, uh, you know, as I was reflecting, I came up with my own kind of observations and tools or tips. So I'm going to say a little bit about, again, trying to reduce your alcohol consumption or quit altogether and offer what I would say are some tools or tips that I've come up with to maybe help in the process. So let me just start off by saying that I have a newfound appreciation really for non-drinkers. Um, you know, I never used to have that uh, uh, admiration really for, for people who, who um, don't consume. 
Uh, but now, knowing the numbers and knowing you know the psychology involved and how difficult it can be to refrain, you know, especially after you've maybe ha had a bad, bad habit with it for a while, I have a great deal of admiration for um, non-drinkers. Whether again they are former alcoholics or they just never drink at all, you know, the whole spectrum really of non-drinkers. Because I think obviously if you've overcome addiction, you know, your previous uh, I guess there's no such thing as a previous alcoholic, right? That's obviously um, overcoming that is huge. But even someone who hasn't ever been physically addicted, even someone who has never consumed alcohol at all, to me that's very respectable because it's so prolific in our culture and society. It is everywhere. We're inundated with alcohol, not only with alcohol, but with positive associations with it. So to be able to nonetheless navigate through life and never had um, submitted or uh, to the urge at some point to see what everyone else is consuming, see what all the fuss is about. To me, that, I don't know, that there's something respectable there. Um, so again, the whole spectrum of non-drinkers, uh, this process of preparing for this episode and like doing my research on alcohol, I've really garnered a lot of respect for, for non-drinkers. Again, it's not easy to say no, especially given how ubiquitous alcohol is in our in our culture and society. So, uh, I alluded to this much earlier, but in my personal experience, this has definitely been true. Right? I mentioned how when I first quit uh, drinking this year earlier, right? It was I, I thought about a lot more in the month of January. You know, alcohol. You know, you know at the end of the day, I have to get everything done. Whereas I would every other day or every, what was it? Fourth day, I would, you know, start drinking some beer. Um, you know, in January, I would do that. I would think about doing that oftentimes, but in February, not so much in March, not really much at all. And then here in April, I haven't really thought about it, you know, at all. So, um, that's all to say that, uh, to speak to the notion that time really does make a difference, perhaps even exponentially. Right? It becomes exponentially easier the further away from your last uh, drink, right? It becomes exponentially easier to just to say no or to oftentimes to not even think about it, right? So there's that time's ob uh, definitely a factor. And that's probably true of a lot of things, right, uh, that we're trying to um, distance ourselves from, right? Whether it's um, a bat, you know, time heals all wounds, right? So same sort of deal is probably going on with overcoming alcohol, right? It's just a lot of it is just a matter of time and um, a matter of overcoming bad habits or what's going on at a subconscious level, right? The more time where you are forming instead the better pattern of behavior and the, the better habit is in place, right? Of not drinking, the easier it becomes, right? To, to overcome those previous habits. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so, um, you know, if you're going to go about quitting or trying to cut back, that's going to entail, obviously, um, tackling previously alcohol-associated events, right? So um, we all have, I think, um, events or situations or scenarios, right? College, thinking back to the day, you know, the weekends, right? If you're in college, and parties and so on. For me, nowadays, as an older adult, the holidays, Christmas, um, you know, I'll take whole, I have... In the past few years, I've, there's been times where I've taken a whole month off from alcohol. And obviously, the last three months I've taken off. But alternatively, there's also been times where I've drank nine days straight. And that t typically is in December, right, over a holiday. So that's going to be one of the more difficult or strange to experience scenarios without alcohol for me because it's always been paired with it, you know, uh, these holidays or in vacations, same sort of deal. And by the way, this is one of the things that I'm these uh, Porter speaks to a lot is the same sort of deal where he talks about, you know, flying and how he would oftentimes drink before with flying and how so part of the sort of process of quitting entailed in engaging in that process without drinking for the first time. Um, so he, he does a similar thing. The whole point was in working through some of these common instances or examples where he would have to uh, experience it sober for the first time. So holidays are a big one for me, you know, hanging out at friends, you know, going over to a buddy's, um, the same buddy that drank, you know, 30 pack, did the 30 pack challenge a couple times. Um, you know, I like to go over to his house and usually when I do, you know, we hang out in his garage and drink beer. 
So that will obviously be different. You know, am I going to bring root beer over? Uh, you know, what's what's that going to be like? Um, walk. So I play a lot of hockey. You know, three, four, five games a week sometimes, um, without fail. Literally, I can't think of a time when there has not been beer after the game. And even though I have, I've said no every time this entire season. So 20 games uh, times, you know, three teams or whatever. They'll still ask me every time, literally every time. You know, they'll as they're going around with the the bag of beer. Do you want one? I'll, I'll still say no. So. You know, that, um, that obviously is a, there's a culture of beer drinking. You know, they call it the beer league, right, after all. So those are three um, kind of scenarios or examples of difficult, if you will, situations or scenarios that I would face if I'm going to have to or try to not have to, you know, whatever the case might be, um, eliminate altogether or cut back my alcohol consumption. Now, Tool, t- tool or tip number one is the idea that knowledge is power, kind of, and that you should read, read, read if you want to really improve your chances of cutting back or eliminating it altogether. And not, I, I, I emphasize that with respect to saying or talking about these difficult situations because one of the things, for example, Porter would suggest is if you're viewing these scenarios and situations still as being difficult, if you have to go through them without alcohol, you're not really seeing things, right? You're not, you haven't really seen the light because if you if you truly know the, the the facts about alcohol, he says he argues, you're not going to view it as being difficult to go through these events or these scenarios without alcohol because you're not going to want the alcohol. So I find that kind of interesting, right? That um, if Porter's to be, to be believed, if we've really done what we need to do and educate ourselves. He thinks that's key, right? Knowledge is power. We have to educate our, ourselves. And I think he's probably right on that, um, right? We'll realize the truth about alcohol and how it is a poison and how it works and so on. Uh, and if we've really come to appreciate that, then we shouldn't have the desire anymore at all, right? So it shouldn't be construed anymore as difficult. Maybe strange still because you were so used to drinking during those scenarios so it might be strange to not drink right but it shouldn't be difficult because you should know the reality and that's that life without alcohol is much better again if porter can be believed and i would suggest again my tool or tip in general is that there is something to that if you want to uh, improve your chances of eliminating or reducing your consumption of alcohol or any problematic um, substance i think knowledge is power doing the research, you know, educating yourself about what alcohol really is doing to you mentally, you know, physically, and so on. That's going to do nothing but help you um, insofar as kind of talk about all the, the crap, right? The ugly truth that's associated with alcohol. How can that not but help you then and not drinking right? when you're exposed to all the, the crap, right? It's thrust in your face how, you know, how it leads to difficult lives in so many different respects. Okay, so that was tool or tip number one, right? Knowledge is power. You got to educate yourself on it. It will really help you. Right? Read some of these books right, that I went through. Uh, another point, kind of tool or tip point related to that one, the knowledge is power idea is, and also related to my spiel on the subconscious or the psychology of drinking, right, is, um, Kind of my a notion that a lot of whether you're successful or not, it's going to come down to what I call willpower, right? And how much of it you're able to exert. How much willpower do you have? I always pride myself on my my willpower, right? You challenge me to anything, and I'll, I'll do it. Right? And, um, you know, I can quit this, right? I can quit alcohol. I can can I can I stop for a month? Yes. Can I stop for three months? Yes. Right. So that takes what I call willpower. And what do I mean by that? It's sort of uh, your willingness, right, to proceed in a conscious sort of way, make a conscious effort, right, to think about things in a critical sort of way, in a rational way, right, rather than just proceed on subconscious autopilot. Right? So if you're exerting willpower with respect to this sort of thing, it's going to entail 
a kind of conscious, rational, um, logical approach to the matter. Right? Uh, you're not going to just have recourse to falling back on old habits, bad habits, right? And um, you are going to, uh, right? You're not going to fall back on that autopilot mode. You're going to, when let's say temptation arises, you're going to sit there and analyze it and think things through instead of just giving in initially right away to the bad feeling that you're experiencing as a result of your bad day and thus immediately, right, think about beer and you're hence working on autopilot. You're going through all these steps in a sort of subconscious manner without even thinking about it, right? You're not going to allow yourself to do that. You're going to take control. You're going to exert what I call, again, willpower, right? Uh, you're going to take control. You're going to demand to think about this critically, consciously, rationally, um, to every time you're tempted to take a drink, right? Not to just fall back on autopilot mode, but to maybe pick up one of these books, right? To remind yourself of what it's, this is one of the things that helped me, right? Uh, remind yourself about how bad the next day is. Think about that, right? Rather than just letting yourself quickly fall back into just mood and emotion and stop thinking, right? You've got to keep up that critical, rational component of the, the process. I think that's key. Okay. Another thing, this is, um, how do I want to put this? This is um, another reoccurring thing, especially in Porter, right? And that's this, so I'm going to kind of echo that in my, uh, sort of the way he puts it, but in my own way. Um, it's uh, kind of the idea that if you're turning to drink, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, the suggestion is, right, you got to ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that you're picking up the bottle in the first place? Or anytime you're looking for something, you want something, whether that's to drink or consume alcohol or want anything at all. The implication is that the moment, the now, what you have isn't satisfactory, isn't good enough. And a lot, I think, of recovery or quitting or reducing um, is coming to an appreciation that, well, actually what you have, right, what's already there in the moment, that is perfect. That's already good. That's what your body tells you, right? Going through all those physiological processes and reactions we went through, right? It's already perfect. It's at, it wants to maintain equilibrium at that optimal level, that perfect level. And for some reason, maybe all the advertising we've been subjected to and so on, right? Um, we convince ourselves that it's not, right? And that we need, we want something more that what we have now, the moment isn't good enough. And so we take the first drink. And so we keep drinking. Um, and so I think, again, what we have to come to realize is that we have to kind of come to appreciate that, right? That the way things are is already, in some sense, as good as they're going to be. These drugs aren't going to help. Um, and you have to figure out if you can't handle what that moment is, what now is, what reality is, as it is now, why is that? You have to fix that, right, before you'll ever be able to improve in terms of your drinking. And you have to improve in terms of those underlying issues. Whatever it is that's making you think, right, that, that, that what you already have isn't good enough. Whatever is leading you to think, you got to solve that. Otherwise, it'll all be for naught, you know, your attempts to consume because you'll always still be in that state of mind of thinking that what you have isn't good enough, right? And fixing that is really, I think, one of the biggest tips I have, right, is um, fixing that state of mind and, and reorienting your thinking and getting yourself to realize that, uh, that that process is happening, that you're always wanting and why is that, but then also to realize what your body's telling you and that really, you know, what we all want is like the most happiness possible. That's already there, right? At least physiologically, we're already at an optimal level, right? We're just screwing things up by putting all these foreign substances in there. So a tool or tip to, to, um, quit alcohol would then be to to realize that we don't need it that it's not going to add anything that it's not going to make things better when things are already as good as they can be right? 
I don't know if I said that very well, uh, but hopefully maybe some of that came across. So how do I put it in notes here? To overcome alcohol or addiction, or really any, again, any substance um, addiction, you have to fix normal or better. You have to realize that normal doesn't need to be fixed, right? Um, you have to better acclimate yourself to normal and realize that that's okay. Um, so the moral, find a way to accept reality that is your life as it already is. Right? Stop thinking you need something more. Of course, that's always easier said than done. Okay, another tool or tip, and I've uh, alluded to this one several times. Focus on what you will lose the next day, regardless of what you stand to gain, you know, in terms of positive effects. If any, again, I'm... Not sure how many positive effects um, really are associated with the alcohol, right? Let's say we go out and have a good time, by the way. Uh, Porter talks about this. Let's say you go out and have a great time with friends and you're, you're drinking. Well, was it the drinking that led you to have a good time or was it the, the friends? He suggests that, you know, a lot of times we pair oh, having a great time when we went out with friends and we're drinking. We associate, associate that with the alcohol and a lot, of, a lot of it was actually, maybe all of it was actually just being with our friends in the first place. Um, so anyway, regardless, let's just grant that there's some, you know, positive effects though, okay? that there are these tangible positive, positive effects associated with going out and drinking, right? That night or that day, uh, focus on all the stuff that comes afterwards the next day, right? What do you get like three, four or five hours of, let's say awesomeness the night you went out to drink? Well, then you have what? 12 hours, 15 hours the next day of physical and mental hell I mean in many respects right so no matter how good things were the previous night you will have hell to pay the next day you will be less likely to work out you will be less likely to you know do chores you will be less likely to be productive in so far as you do anything you, you will be um, more likely to be grumpy irritable right upset easily right? so Granted, even granted, we get some, we can glean some benefits, positive stuff from drinking the night before. Focus on all of what's to come the next day, right? Um, to me, I mentioned this earlier, right? that has, that always helps. Like if I'm on the, um, it helps in the sense that if you want to quit, right? Because it leads me to not drink oftentimes. Not only alcohol, but as I mentioned earlier, caffeine too, because I'll think about it's negative effects the next day because I don't drink caffeine usually, right? So um, oftentimes in borderline instances where I can either have a drink or not, if I think about the next day, I will not have the drink, right? No, I don't want to, right? Because one usually ends up to be three or four. Right? And if you're like me, again, maybe my experience is relative, but I never just drink one or two beers. Usually it's like four or five or what was it? Six on average. So um, yeah. Uh, there's, there's always going to be hell to pay the next day. Focus on that. Okay. Another thing that kind of, I guess I call it a tool tip or tip, but, uh, kind of an odd thought is maybe a better way to describe it. But something I thought about, you know, preparing for the episode is when we start, like imagine gasoline. Um, if we figured out, if you drink it somehow, we could do it and it wouldn't you know, kill us, um, you know, too quickly. Right. Imagine that uh, we figured out if you consume it, right, throw in a bunch of other things so that you can make it palatable so you could actually drink it. Otherwise, you might gag. Reminds me of something else. Um, let's say we could, that that's all the case, right? We can make it consumable, and we figured out you know, drinking gasoline gave us a high or made us feel good. Would we start doing that? Would we start manufacturing special drinks, putting in gasoline right, to mask its, or sorry, starting with gasoline, putting in these other elements into these special drinks to mask right, the terrible smell and taste of gasoline, would we nevertheless consume it right, if it made us feel good? And if you're thinking, no, well, what's the difference? Right? Alcohol smells repulsive. Right? And if we're being honest, the alcohol itself tastes terrible. Right? And that's our body, again, our body's natural, right? our sense of smell and taste if something smells or tastes foul, that's our body's way of 
sort of an initial response of saying bad, right? It should be another indication that there's something problematic about alcohol at a fundamental level, right? That it's essentially a poison. Okay? So, so if we found out the gasoline had these intox, uh, this sort of intoxicating effect, we wouldn't go and, or would we? I mean, I don't know. Would we go and start making all sorts of gasoline drinks? Um, and yet we seem to be doing precisely that with alcohol. Um, you know, if we think of the gasoline scenario as ludicrous, why don't we think of the alcohol scenario as ludicrous? Okay, final tool or, or tip to cut back. Uh, another way I've sort of come to appreciate like the effect, especially that alcohol might be taking on our lives. It's, it um, is to think about how much of our life it's probably taking off. Or um, So we don't know exactly, obviously, um, say on average, how much of your life each alcoholic drink you consume is taking off, right? We can't say that definitively. We don't know. Okay, but I'm willing to bet that it's definitely taking off some of your life, right? especially um, the more you drink over time, right? So the one thing I thought about was, well, like how, how much it takes off your life probably depends on how much total alcohol you consumed, right? Because if you only, you only drink three total drinks in your entire life, it might have taken like 10 seconds off your life, right? But if you, on average, each drink on average might have only taken 10 seconds off your life. But if you're an alcoholic throughout your entire life, well then, every, you know, all those drinks are probably taking off way more of your life on average. So granted all that, right, the upshot here is think about how much of your life, right, is taken by each drink you consume. Granted, even, let's say that there are some benefits, right? Well, there's, again, I have to think, right, that it is taking each of these drinks of alcohol, right, these alcoholic drinks, they're taking off some period of time off your life. So let's say, on average, 15 minutes. Granted, we don't know exactly. Just imagine that every drink you consume, it's 15 more minutes that you won't be around to see your grandchildren, to see your children, you know, as parents, to explore the world, to do whatever else you wanted to do, right? On average, let's assume, right, as a sort of thought experiment, every alcoholic drink you consume is taking off 15 minutes of your life. Okay, it could be worse, maybe worse than that. Maybe it's not that bad, who knows? But think about that, right, before you go to pick up the next one. You know, how much have you already given up? How many minutes? How many hours? How many days? How many weeks, months, years, how many decades? Some of us have probably given decades of our lives to booze, right? So in my mind, that kind of helps too, right? If you think about it as sort of definitively taking off a certain chunk of your lifetime, right? Um, that is certainly a deterrent from being eager to consume it still. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was all of the first eight parts. So I told you this was going to be quite an extensive episode, and I was not lying. Uh, we will move on to the ninth and final part of the episode here, where, where I will get off the philosophical fence. Try to, anyway. As we've seen before, it's been a struggle. Let me see how the fence goes this time around. Oh boy, faulty construction here. Okay, one more down here. Okay, so question one, the name of the episode. Should human beings consume Alcohol. I don't know why I'm capitalizing on this, but anyway, that's the question. For me, this one is easy, as uh, opposed to all the other, seemingly all the other uh, episodes and all the questions and you get off the philosophical fence sec uh, segments. They were they were all seemingly very difficult. This one is easy for me. Should human beings consume al alcohol? Absolutely not. No, we should not be consuming alcohol. Human beings in general should not consume alcohol, just like they shouldn't consume uh, gasoline or any other toxin that might 
seemingly give them a high, right? Arguably doesn't right? seemingly give them a high, but then creates all these terrible other nasty negative effects, right? No, we shouldn't be consuming uh, alcohol. And I think if we're being honest with ourselves, you know, when we're lying in bed at night, no one else talking to no one else, right? Eyes closed, just us and our thoughts. We'll admit that. We'll admit that we shouldn't be consuming alcohol. There's something problematic about it. Human beings shouldn't be consuming it. It's, it, again, given that immediate reaction, to me, it's it's a poison. Right? Your body wretches when you try to drink it, right? And you have to mask it. Um, so again, I think if we're being honest, lying awake and uh, with our thoughts late at night, we'll admit, at least if we're sober, right, that uh, we should not be consuming alcohol. Of course, the problem is that for many of us, right, insofar as we're not admitting that, I would argue a lot of us are, you know, the reason why is because we're psychologically or physically addicted. Um, so of course that throws in a huge wrench into being honest with ourselves and being able to answer this question honestly. Um, so definitively, yes. Question number two. Will I consume alcohol again? The moment you've all been waiting for, right? So I've alluded to how I have not drank at all this year. So it's like 95 days or something like that. And again, I didn't set about doing that. It just kind of happened. So about midway through March, I did kind of, or even earlier than that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I do want to try to go th three months. When I say try, I mean, I, I knew I'd be able to do it. Like I said, I pride myself on my, my willpower, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to do three months. But, you know, come April, I actually thought I might drink, um, you know, April 1st. And that, that was a Friday. So if it was ever going to happen, you know, I would have been lined up perfectly. I just didn't have the urge. Like I really didn't um, have any desire. And here, what are we on April 5th? And I, I still just haven't indulged. Uh, and um, that's not because I'm like, again, necessarily opposed to it. I'm open to it. I did want to go three months and I did. But now it's just, I don't know. I really don't find myself having the urge to to have a beer anymore, really. Um, again, we still have beer in the garage. Uh, I, it's there, right? But I don't know. There's just, there's a little, I have a root beer. I mentioned this earlier. I have a root beer every night. So I've, I've sort of changed my habits. And maybe this has a lot to do with it. Again, with time, things have changed, right? My old habit of every night, not every night, but, you know, a lot of these nights, unwinding with a six pack. Well, now, every, pretty much every night, I drink a root beer. So I have that habit now instead. And I think a lot of our lives, it is, you know, these habits are just dictating what we're doing. So anyway, I was just kind of speaking to, you know, how I haven't drank up to this point this year. And so will I ever consume alcohol again? This is not an easy answer to me. Um, I, in fact, I, I mean, I was, I'm going to say yes, I think I will. Um, I'm not like what I call him Billy, right? The good buddy of mine who is adamantly, he says anyway, right? N never going to touch the poison again. Um, that's not really my perspective. And to be honest, one of the things I have on my notes here is like, that's actually, it's itself a source of kind of stress for me and, and anxiety because it's like, shouldn't I, after knowing all this and going through all this and rattling all this off, Shouldn't I be like definitively saying no to it? And for some reason, I still feel like oh, I'd like to go over to 30 pack challenge guy's house and have a beer. Maybe still like, I don't want to say definitively that I'm not going to do that. Like there's still some part of me that, that, that sounds appealing. So I don't know. Porter would say that I haven't really seen the light completely. I don't know. Uh, he might be right. Um, so it's obviously you can see it's like a, source of tension for me. It's been a struggle for me. Um, but I'm not ready to completely write off the drug, even though, you know, get, even despite all the things I've, I've said throughout this episode. Um, it's something that I struggle with, sort of what I'm going to do moving on. Um, 
you know, I, again, how do I reconcile? So something I struggle with, and he speaks to Porter and the others, speaks to kind of that, that difficulty of when you, like you've taken time off, then when you're deliberating on when to, when to if ever, go back and have a drink, then there's like this kind of guilt involved because, like, and I'm, I'm saying I relate to that because it's like, oh man, I feel like could just keep going without it. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, there's a, so I don't know if I expressed that well, that well, that when you, um, if you do give in and have a drink, you'll just feel really guilty like you did something terrible. But I don't know, is it that big of a deal? So part of me, again, is this part of my conditioning and growing up and how I did and the rest of my adult years? Is it really that big of a deal if I have a beer every now and then? So obviously I'm still conflicted. Um, will I consume alcohol again? I'm fairly likely that I will. You know, I, again, it's very unsettling to me. Um, conflicted. I I realized that having enumerated all these terrible consequences uh, associated with alcohol, the negatives, that why would I do it again? Yet I'm going to probably, right? But I think it's, you know, we're, we know donuts aren't good for us and yet we still eat donuts, right? So I guess it's kind of like that, you know, I know I shouldn't be eating donuts and yet I still like to munch on a, a donut every now and then. But insofar as we give into that weakness, though, and this is what I kind of feel guilty about and why I'm a little reluctant to have a beer every now and then, isn't that a weakness, giving into a craving for something we know isn't good for us, whether it's a donut or a beer? Isn't that, I don't know, is that nevertheless a weakness? I don't know, ultimately, and obviously, like I said, conflicted here. So while I don't plan on quitting altogether, I'm pretty confident, fairly confident that I won't be drinking very often, right? So if I ever do drink again, it would be very rarely, if I had to guess, maybe three to four times a year. So that's coming from someone who drank, what, every fourth day, and now I'm going to drink, let's say, four days a year. So that's quite a change. So yes, or sorry, no, um, yes, probably here. Question number three. Last question. What should be done about alcohol moving forward? Okay, this is difficult. This is a difficult one. So the only easy one I think I've had here is uh, the first one, right? As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm not one for a lot of, if any, government intervention, right? meddling in our affairs. And so um, prohibition, no, I, I, that's not for me. That's not something that's viable or tenable, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, how how do we proceed? Because I, I you know, I, I don't want to say people can't do it, but at the same time, you know, it seems to be, as I started off the episode, speaking to its significance, it seems to be something that's really plaguing our society and culture, in my opinion, in extremely negative ways. So I really wish I had a, an answer. I, I don't want to prohibit people. Um, I just wish more of us had, I guess, more of an awareness that it wasn't so ubiquitous in our society and culture. And I guess that's kind of what I would end with is just that... Um, in terms of what should we be doing about it moving forward, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to that. It's not prohibition, but it's not status quo either, I don't think. Um, and so I guess I would just end by suggesting that for me, the root, the problem is ultimately rooted in advertising. And, the, and not just the advertising, but the sense in which it's just ever present in our society and culture, but thanks in large part to advertising. I mean, the the deck is stacked in favor of alcohol from the beginning. I mean, again, at least in my experience growing up, right? Think of all the various occasions that are paired with alcohol. All the sporting events, you always see people drinking. How many people are not drinking? In my opinion, usually it's way more are drinking than, than aren't. You know, growing up, did your parents come home after work and, you know, drink a six pack? I mean, was that the norm? Even, I, I don't really, really drink anymore and you know, I don't think of myself as an abnormal drinker, like I suggested. And we have growlers in our kitchen still, right? Empty beer growlers. What kind of an influence and effect is that having on my children? Um, 
you know, even liking to think that I'm not a problem drinker, that, you know, they aren't exposed to the issues associated with alcohol, that's still probably having some sort of effect, maybe subconsciously, right? So it's everywhere is the point. It's everywhere. And then throw on top of that all the advertising, right? The profit involved. Is it any wonder that so many people take take in this toxin, take in this poison, and that it's so difficult to quit if we want to? Okay, so we're all programmed from an early age to to be okay with alcohol and to consume it. And, and who decided that, by the way? Who decided, got to decide that, that it would play such a significant role? I don't know that anyone, I guess, did, but, you know, why is it okay and why is it so ever present, like I said, in our culture and society. Um, I can't help but think back to like cigarettes back when I was growing up and how prolific they were, you know, and a lot of that was due to the advertising. Back when I was a kid, their cigarette smoking, the advertising was everywhere. And not surprisingly, so was smoking. I would go to my grandma's house, they would be smoking all over in the house. Fast forward, you know, 20 years and all the actual, right, evidence of what really happens when we smoke comes to light and you know they i don't know the exact legislation but you know I, you don't see advertising for cigarettes anymore and lo and behold you know fast forward 20 years you, hardly anyone smokes anymore i was just commenting to my wife how you, you never see anyone smoking cigarettes anymore that was crazy even back when we were an undergraduate uh you know uh, back in the early uh, 2000s People were still, there are smokers all over. But now, 20 years later, no. You know, and I think, again, that's in large part because you, there's no advertising. You don't see it anywhere. Okay? And so, again, I wonder, um, you know, people seriously underestimate the power of advertising. And I think that has a huge effect on what we're seeing play out with respect to alcohol. So I don't have the answers, but I think maybe it has something to do with the advertising. Um it certainly has something to do with the ubiquitous nature of alcohol in our society and culture. Now, whether or not, again, I don't, I'm not one for government intervention. So do I want to restrict what can and can't be advertised? That's a difficult issue for me. But if there ever was a time to step in, you know, like, like was the case with cigarettes, I think maybe it would be the case here with alcohol. This might be one of those times. Also, real quick, Stop to think about this for a second. Um, stop to think about why there is so much advertising for alcohol in the first place, right? As um, you probably heard before, if something truly is beneficial and good for you, no advertising for it's necessary, right? The only time advertising is needed is if it's not gonna do you any good, right? If the um, boon for you is not already evident, right? Um, if it is good for you and it's truly beneficial, it's going to need little, if any, advertising. Yet, alcohol is advertised everywhere. So to me, in my mind, that speaks to uh, an attempt to um, try to right, get it more ingrained in our psyche than it otherwise would be, naturally anyway. So ultimately, I think it should, and I predict, at least hopefully it will maybe, be treated you know, exactly like cigarettes were, or experience the same fate that cigarettes did. Right? That eventually, maybe, you know, how long from now, who knows, we'll come to realize, no, there aren't any actual positive health benefits from alcohol. No, there aren't actually any good psychological effects associated with alcohol. Right? That's just sort of an illusion. Uh, and we'll realize just how, how terrible it is and maybe the government will come in then and restrict the advertising like it did with respect to cigarettes. That's kind of what I think is going to happen. And honestly, in my mind, that would be a fate well-deserved for what I can't help but call a poison. So that's it. That's all I have to say. That's a lot that I had to say, admittedly. Um, I don't know if you made it all the way through. Uh, or if you skipped ahead, but thanks for joining me. Again, this was episode four of The Great Philosophical Abyss, where I asked, among other things, should human beings consume alcohol? Thank you.